Hi, Paul. Oh, click here on mute. There I am, unmuted. Perfect. Awesome. Um, unless you have any questions, I will put you in the waiting room. It's going to be a you fun day. You put me night. in the waiting room, and I'm going to get some better lighting so that my picture comes out a little better. Awesome. All right. Sounds good. Talk to you soon. All right.
I'm here. Oh, there he is. Okay. By my clock, it's uh, 9.30, I'm 5.30, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Regular Council meeting of February the 14th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. Do you have a quorum? Do we have any public speakers on the closed session item? Give me just one moment to confirm. And no, you do not have any public speakers on the closed session items. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. So I will see you all in a moment.
Okay. Okay, I believe it's 6.30. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of February 14th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand electronically, and I will call on you in turn so that we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Council member Fair. Here. Council member, uh, Council member Pearson. Here. Council member Yering. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Here. Mayor Grisanti. Here. Do you have a quorum? Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. Of, of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the Republic, Republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. all. Okay. May I have a closed session report? Yes, Mayor, members of the Council, good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. The council did convene a closed session tonight at 5.30 to discuss the two items listed on the closed session agenda, both related to public employment pursuant to government code section 54957. The council took no reportable actions during the course of that meeting and the meeting ended at 6.05 p.m. tonight. That concludes my report. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda or any changes that want to be made to the agenda? Karen? Uh, yes, I I would move that we take public comments on items 1C3 and 1C4. Okay. Is there a second? I will second the motion, uh, but I'd, I'd like to hear a little background. I, I'm caught off guard that it hasn't been done in the past, but I feel I've heard from other people that it has, so I'm a little confused on that, to be honest. Mayor Santi, members of the council, I can jump in there. My understanding, and I was a little caught off guard by it too, was that there is, this has been historically treated as a, hip, uh, as a ceremonial item. As such, they were not allowing public comment in the past. Um, we have had several requests to speak. If there's action to be taken, I believe that there should be public comment as it is um, customary under the Brown Act to allow public comment on all items uh, listed on your agenda. Um, it's at this point, because it's historically been um, viewed as ceremonial um, in, in consultation with the city clerk, we decided that we would stick with custom and advise people that if the council wanted to allow public comment, it certainly could. And so that's why we are where we are. Happy to answer Thank you, Mr. On that. Thank you, Mr. Cotty. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, th this is awkward. I'm going to say, as, as everyone knows, as a general matter, I favor more public input over less. 
and I always favor following the law. So if the law requires public comment on this, um, I think that's we ought to we need to follow the law. Um, if it's not required, though, contrary to my desire to have more public input than less, I just want to say the following thing, which is there wasn't public comment on December 14, 2020, when City Council broke the tradition of pointing, appointing as mayor pro tem the newly elected member who received the most votes in the election. None. There was no public comment on April 26, 2021, the last time we appointed mayor and mayor pro tem. And in fact, prior to that meeting, I wrote to the city clerk and the now former city manager, and I asked, why is there no public comment on these matters? Because I know a lot of people want to comment. I was told it's just not done, it's ceremonial, just as, as John just recited a few moments ago. Uh, as, con as confrontational as you all know me to be, I accepted that answer. And I didn't insist that the people who wanted to speak ought to be given the right to speak because I was told it wasn't done. So it just seems wrong to me to be making changes on the fly. I mean, if, if we've done it unlawfully, we need to change it. That's, that's, but if it's a matter of policy, I think we need to make that policy decision in a more relaxed manner, not on the evening that the issue arises. Um, so that's where I am. I, I just, I know there's going to be a lot of, this is going to be the same as it's been every time when this wasn't even the issue on the agenda. There's going to be a number of people here who are going to come and speak well of me. There's going to be a number of people who are going to come here to denigrate me. We all know who they are. We all know what they're all going to say in both directions. And if it's not necessary to spend time going through that once again, I think it would be preferable to just get on with business. Thank you, Bruce. Steve, I see your hand. Uh, yes, I, you know, also encourage as much public comment as we can get. Uh, and again, I think Bruce is correct. If, if we're breaking the law, and then we should change it tonight. But we did uh, the agenda did not indicate to residents that they would have an opportunity to speak. So there may be people out there who would have spoken that don't won't show up because they don't know about it. And I don't think that's fair. If we're going to have a, a item where they're going to have a chance to talk about to speak to it. I think we got to promote that early enough so everybody who wants to speak can come in and do that. We did not do that in this case. So I would stick with tradition unless, like Bruce said, we're breaking the law someplace. So thank you, Paul. John, would you like to comment on whether or not we're breaking a law? I would, I would say this, the Brown Act requires that all items of business be conducted with an opportunity for the public to comment prior to action being taken. I think historically there's never been any controversy with the selection of the mayor and vice mayor. I don't know that tonight will be any different. And that's why typically there's been no public comment. Um, if there is, you know, I would argue that the public has a right to comment on who their next mayor is. But the counter to that is, of course, that it's a ceremonial position. And it has no more power as mayor than than does the mayor pro tem or any other council member. So um, I think the best practice, the conservative practice, is to allow public comment. But I understand the historical um, practice in the city has not been to allow it. And that's why we had the conversation that uh, the city clerk and I had. At, at this point, I would say it's a matter of council preference if it wants to do it. Um, and, and that's where I would I would leave the, my comments. Do you think we're taking a Brown Act risk? Um, as I've said many times, anybody can make their way to the courthouse. Um, yes, there, there could be a risk. But again, your historical practice has been, and Kelsey can certainly correct me where I'm wrong, to not allow public comment on this side. Um, okay. So if, as, as long as the public's known that, you know, I, I would be comfortable making the making the pitch for no public comment. Okay, uh, Mikey and then Bruce. I think what Bruce said is accurate that, you know, we have an idea of what the public wants to speak on, but I don't think that's the same thing as not giving them the right to hear it. When I'm looking at the, and, and I do believe actually there's been a couple of the comment in this in Malibu, which is not when we've been on council. Um, and cause 
Well, that's what I've been told by a number of residents. Um, and I don't know the truth of it. I didn't try and look it up. But when I look at the agenda, there's nowhere except to A that mentions public comment. Every item is just listed. So um, I don't know. It's interesting that how would the public know where public comments allowed or not? And I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not in favor of wanting to just sit here all night and hear public comment, but at the same time, I am. <laughs> I mean, I think the public has a right to say their piece and for however it goes. So I, 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 uh, I was unaware. I think Bruce and I had a conversation about this. I was unaware that it had, was not done before because it just seems like there's so much comment on everything we do. So uh, I don't know. I, I would just have trouble. It, it does seem odd that the public can't comment on this. That's all. It, and uh, it surprises me. It hasn't been available before. And actually, I've been at swearing ins where a lot of people commented. So I take that back. But it was, um, you know, cities coming and thanking the outgoing mayor. It was things like that. I remember, you know, going on and on in the past. So um, anyhow, that's my comment. Bruce, and then I see we also have two members of the public, and I don't know if that's appropriate to hear from them at this time. Bruce? Well, in light of John's comments, I, I, I will support having public comment because, as I said, I'm, I'm always in support of us doing what's legally appropriate. And um, I think it's unfortunate that when this was raised in the past under prior city leadership, it was done unlawfully. So let's follow the law. Okay. Can someone uh, instruct me on whether or not we should go ahead and do, take the vote or hear from the public before we take this vote? Well, I think there's a motion. I think you have a motion and a second, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right. So we call a question then? Yes. Please. Kelsey, can you call a question for us, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion okay. carries. And with that direction from Council, I am going to enable public speaker signups for items 1C3 and 1C4. The public will also be able to raise their hand using the reaction button during that item if they'd like to indicate they would like to speak. Okay, I believe we still need a motion to approve the agenda now that we've modified it. I'll move to approve the agenda as modified. I'll second. I've got a motion and a second to approve the agenda as modified. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item number 1A, update on the Malibu Community Labor Exchange activities. Mayor Grisanti, if I could just give you a brief report on the posting of the agenda. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 3rd, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on February 10th, 2022. Thank you. Uh, now we are at item 1A, which is an update on the Malibu Community Labor Exchange activities. Who do we have presenting? We do have Kay Gabbard here to present. Just give us one moment to get her online. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You have Oscar, too. Hey, Oscar isn't connected to audio on the computer he's using for video. Um, he's on his phone. Okay. We'll work he, on he, getting him. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening, council members. Thank you very much for this opportunity to come back and redeem myself and let you know a little bit about uh, the labor exchange uh, in its current 
uh, uh, day to day activities. Uh, as many of you know, we were started in 1993 by the city of Malibu and some local community members who were trying to bring some dignity to the day laborers who were standing on the corner getting work, looking for work and getting work. Um, next slide. Oh, this is a, just a slide. That was a slide of some of the workers who are there. Um, thank you. That's Oscar. Um, the Melbourne Community Labor Exchange is 29 years old. It's a member, proud member of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, which is uh, a group of 50 day labor sites, 50 plus day labor sites across the United States who advocate for day labor rights. And um, uh, we're a proud member of that group. Uh, you wanted to know some numbers, so I put together some numbers for you. I did fourth quarter of 2019 and fourth quarter of 2021. Let's look at 2019. There were, in that quarter, there were 2,118 job seekers. Those were people who came to the labor exchange looking for jobs. It doesn't mean there were 2,000 of them. It means there is a certain number of them and they came back on different days looking for jobs. So um, I, I hope that makes sense. The number of those job seekers who found jobs in that fourth quarter of 2019 was 990, male 935, female 55. Uh, approximately 7% of those job seekers were unhoused. In the fourth quarter of 2021, our most recent quarter, job seekers 2601, 2,118 male and 483 female jobs found, 1,752 in the fourth quarter of 2021, and approximately 9% of that those job seekers were unhoused. Um, the pictures that you see are uh, Oscar and one of our workers, one of our day laborers. And the Venice Family Clinic, which was kind enough to come out uh, and vaccinate our day laborers uh, who are were, of course, among the most vulnerable uh, people, more so than our unhoused people, really. Um, and they came out several times to vaccinate them and boost them. We were very um, thankful for that. Next slide, please. Oh, any questions on that slide? Okay. Um, this, this slide shows the emergency preparedness and safety uh, Saturday morning that we had, which was sponsored by the city of Malibu, as well as um, the Malibu Foundation and the Labor Exchange. It was conducted in Spanish. It was to make sure that our workers are pre as prepared as possible for any emergency that happens in Malibu, whether it's a fire earthquake, whether it's a uh, uh, something that happens in the house while they're there. Uh, our Pepperdine Spanish language students were our translators that day. We were very happy to have them. It was a very successful day. Um, those were the flyers that went out in Spanish and English. And it was not just for the day laborers. It was for anyone who had any knowledge of anybody in Malibu, the Malibu area, who worked in the Malibu area, who might benefit from this. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the skills that our workers have, uh, housekeeping, elder care, brush clearance, et cetera. I don't know how many of you have ever used them, but these are some of the skills that they have. Next slide. And these are some other pictures from the Spanish language Saturday uh, emergency preparedness. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask me? Were we able to get a hold of Oscar? Kelsey? Yes, it looks like he is connected to audio now, so I'm asking him to unmute. Well, he is um he is our biggest advocate. He is the heart of the labor exchange. He has been he was hired 29 years ago. He continues to be the heart of the labor exchange. I can't even begin 
uh, to talk about it in the way that he can. So I'm going to turn it over to Oscar. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for having us uh, uh, at this council meeting. And it's important to remember that the labor exchange was a creation of the city of Malibu together with the local churches back in 93. Uh, some activists like Martin Chi were involved in this process. And the first city council, uh, the head of that time when we first incorporated, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, let, me, let me change that. The first board members of the labor exchange were appointed by the city councils in 1993. Ever since then, we have gotten your support, and so we are so grateful for it. And for 29 years, thanks to the good work of KMA and the people and that miracle of the heart, we're able to survive. We don't have a uh, budget from anybody, it's just donations, and that's what we have. Uh, our work is all for the city of Malibu. And uh, any homeowner that wants to uh, needs to our help, all they, do, all they gotta do is call us. We're uh, open six days a week, 6.30 in the morning to one o'clock in the afternoon. We've been able to help people during the many rains that we had in Malibu and also fires. So we're there as a resource for this beautiful city of Malibu. And we continue to get uh, uh, support from local people and we hopefully get your support in the coming years as we have done in the past. So I appreciate that and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Oscar. Okay. I believe that takes us to item 1B. Mayor, I see a lot of hands raised, but I suspect they might not be for the item we're hearing is my guess, but I just want to point that out. Uh, okay, I'm trying. Uh, these, are just there... present, these are just presentations of information. They're not even matters for which we're going to ceremonially right. vote. Okay. Correct. Moving right along then, to we are at item 1B. Uh, apparently, Caltrans is going to make a presentation to us okay, on their Clean California that? program. I'm on the TV if you want, because I'm going to have to do that. Do we have someone from? Yes. Good evening, uh, Mayor Grisandi and a uh, member of the City Council, uh, also public members in, uh, in attendance. My name is Hammer Sui, a Caltrans District 7 uh, Clean California Program Manager. Along with me tonight um, is our Senior Landscape Architect, uh, Keith Sellers, and also Clean California Pro Project Manager, uh, John Zaki. Yeah, if we will move uh, to the next slide, please. Uh, we wanna take this opportunity to engage um, uh, City of Malibu community members and also uh, uh, to introduce briefly of the Clean California program. Um, then particularly we wanna share the Solstice Canyon uh, Creek art proposal that under the beautification uh, part of the Clean California program and as well as wanting to reach out and engage the local artists uh, for this project. Yeah, next one, please. Yeah, if I may, I'll briefly uh, first introduce the program. Clean California really has four components uh, uh, of the uh, uh, that, and then first is um, uh, the education program. Education program is um, uh, you know, we wanted to have a, uh, a shared understanding of the responsibility of uh, not littering and also the impact uh, of the litter that will bring to our public health and public safety. In, and by simply just uh, removing the litter continuously is never going to be adequate. You know, Caltrans does not generate litter, um, but this is more of a a, a social uh, issue and more of a corporate issue. So we want to through um, these programs to really address um, and uh, eliminate the litter. And so another part of this program, Clean California program is a, a local grants, you know, by investing in community um, and also to, um, uh, uh, to engage and uh, assist the local artists 
and that that is the uh, local grant program, which a uh, number of applications uh, were received. In fact, the due date was February 1st, and the program rollout was uh, beginning accepting the uh, uh, applications were December last year. And by March 1st, uh, these applications and the grant application will be awarded um, on a statewide basis. So uh, lastly is the state beautification component of the program. And which is the particular one that we're going to discuss and as an art proposal for uh, the Solstice uh, Canyon Creek, um, uh, you know, the covert current covert is going to be replaced and, but when the eventual project is completed is a bridge replacement, then the art proposed is going to be on the side of the wall of that. So that um, basically um, is a brief introduction of uh, Clean California program, the four parts of it. And next slide, please. So next I'll uh, kind of briefly introduce the uh, funding program. Three of the four components are two-year programs. So the education, the state beautification, including the local grants program, those are th two years funding. And the litter abatement component is a three-year funding. Um, next, please. So this is the particular location um, of this uh, proposed art uh, where it's going to be uh, uh, on, on the, is actually uh, beneath the uh, PCH. Um, there's a, a crossing, there's a under, currently is a culvert mainly for for uh, for water and drainage, and then the proposal is to enable the fish to sl swim um, up upstream, and also at the same time allowing pedestrians to walk underneath safely. Um, so, with that, uh, more details about the proposed public art location uh, and uh, what it will look like, and how uh, we would want to. Um, listen to the community's input. Um, I would like to introduce our senior landscape architect, uh, Keith Sellers, to present the next few slides, please. Keith, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. And next slide. Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. I hear you. Hi, I'm Keith Sellers, a senior landscape architect at Caltrans District 7. So the clean, this is an existing view of the existing clean, um, existing culvert at Solstice Canyon. Uh, the project is going to widen this and put in a walkway uh, that goes under PCH. So the Clean California project will add public art mural to the wall underneath the new bridge over Solstice Creek and opposite the new walkway. And the art will beautify the underpass. In order to meet the funding dates of the Clean California, the artwork will be painted on panels and then displayed at an alternate location. We were thinking about City um, Malibu City um, City Hall, if that's possible. And uh, once the uh, underpass is completed in approximately 2026, then it will be um, permanently attached to the walls of the new underpass. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of what uh, the panel would look like. And you're all familiar with the mural under the uh, Leo Carrillo uh, PCH bridge. So mm -hmm. we're thinking about something like that, but it'll be up to um, the artist, of course. But we'd like to have something that's um, environmentally sensitive, maybe something depicting the fish passage that the project is being constructed for, and also uh, marine life. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the, uh, so the red is where the artwork would be, and then the gray is the proposed walkway. All right. Um, thank you, Keith. So this is not something like we we decide and, and then ask for a public comment. This is just the location where we're proposing to put the public art on. We'd like to connect through the city's art commission and to reach out to the local artists and, and have, 
hopefully the the cultural aspect, the connection, and the um, uh, history of, of the city will be incorporated into, and also the education component of uh, uh, fish, water, clean water, water quality, and uh, 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 wildlife, and all that will be incorporated into the art. And that is where we wanted to, through this opportunity, to um, engage the art community in Malibu. And currently, um, the method that we can deliver the project uh, is through a cooperative agreement with the city. And we do um, ask that the city would take on the responsibility for the maintenance of the art in the future. Um, so the Clean California program, really the funding is for capital outlay for the improvement itself, but there is no subsequent funding for the maintenance um, uh, thereafter. And with that, um, next slide, please. I'd like to share a brief timeline. So since the Clean California uh, uh, program is a two-year funding for the beautification side, the construction of this must be completed by June 2023. And uh, uh, late last year, we did uh, uh, engage um, the city in trying to seek alignment. And so that's why uh, we're here and for this public, uh, for this uh, council meeting, and number one, trying to gain uh, alignment with the city and uh, through this uh, uh, cooperative agreement approach, we can deliver the project. Caltrans will be the funding agency um, and also through uh, the art commission to reach out uh, local artists for the design itself. So once the panels are constructed, we'll maybe uh, seek temporary housing at the city hall, somewhere safe and yet for a public exhibit uh, until the uh, underpass is constructed the projected uh, of this construction will uh, will be um, completed I, by October 2024. Nonetheless, the artwork will be completed by June 2023. So roughly, there is about a year time that that uh, uh, this art needs to be in exhibit to public and be housed elsewhere before the final mounting. So with that, um, come to the last slide, please. And if there are any questions, um, we're ready to answer, but otherwise we conclude the presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. When are you planning on uh, starting construction of the project? Starting construction of the underpass project is, uh, the advertisement is gonna be end of this year, December, 2022 um, as scheduled. So maybe the end of 2023? Uh, uh, no, Mr. Mayor, the, the completion of the project of not the art project, but the, the bridge uh, replacement is gonna be um, October, 2024. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, and do you think you would commence it when? Commence of the... Uh, when can we expect uh, to have lanes closed and things going on like that? Uh, that I I would have to uh, connect with the uh, of the project manager of that project, but uh, advertisements usually a month or two, so maybe February uh, March, just a rough estimate when the work would hit the ground um, from the advertisement date. Okay. An estimate. Yeah. Thank you. I see Bruce has raised his hand, and then yeah, thanks, uh, Paul. Steve. I, you know, this sounds sounds like a really nice project. Sounds like it'll be um, visually appealing. I just wonder how we're going to keep it from being graffitied and destroyed, and what thoughts been given to that. I heard you say that the city would be responsible for maintaining it. I, you know, given the way things have been of late here, I just don't see it being kept in the proper condition that it ought to be. So what thoughts have been given to that? It, it, yes, council member, the, the, um, by design, and there will be a graffiti preventative kind of measure um, be a part of the design. I would like our senior landscape architect maybe to touch on to respond to that, please. Um, Keith, if you're unmuted. Uh, yes, we would put a graffiti coating on that. 
um, but it has to be replenished uh, every so often. And so once the artwork is installed, um, we don't have the capability of maintaining it. So it'll be on the city to maintain it from then on. But there is a graffiti coating that uh, you can wash vandalism off, spray paint and that kind of thing. Keith, would you briefly touch on the maintenance cost level based on what your research? I would have to... Uh, Sorry about that. I'd have to follow up with that. Um, I don't have those numbers right now. We have a transportation art person that I could ask. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll follow through um, on this question. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I see Steve Uring has his hand raised. Uh, yes, how are you gonna go about picking the artist for this project? Um, it, it, yes, sir. Um, thank you for the question. That's where uh, earlier, as, as mentioned, that they would currently the method of the project delivery would be through a cooperative agreement with the city. So basically, Caltrans will be the funding agency and the city and through the city's uh, art commission and so on, the selection could be collectively agreed upon and uh, be eventually selected. So the city will be selecting the artist. Uh, uh, yes, sir. And the Caltrans and the city would be uh, uh, partnered in this selection. Okay. So Paul, back to you. Thank you. I see uh, Rob, and then I'm going to go to Bruce after Rob. Rob DeBow. Yes. Uh, um, a couple of things that I want to just mention. Um, uh, about the maintenance, the we'll, we'll bring an item closer to, to council, kind of once we know a little bit more of the details, try to get some input to see what council wants to do, if we want to take on the maintenance or, or do we want to push back on Caltrans for the maintenance and kind of figure that out. So we'll, we'll bring an item to this. Um, uh, and tonight, Hammer is here today just to kind of just to let you know the, the program that they're, that they're trying to do. Uh, we're currently, right now, we're, uh, Jesse and myself are going to work with Hammer to to work out the details on getting the the artists because we want to have local artists kind of do this, kind of see where we are. So, so right now we're 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 going to have this um, go to the Arts Commission, try to get the art the artist that way, and kind of see how this moves forward, and then bring an item to council because I I want to get your guys' input on um on the flavor of kind of maintenance or not and kind of see where we are with that so um that's my two cents i hope that answers some questions thank you rob okay uh the next item is presentations to outgoing mayor but before we proceed i've noticed we have some people in the audience who seem to be intent on disrupting, will you please remove Johnny Deep and not allow him in and re remove Meat Boy, whoever he is, and not allow him in. Thank you. So that we are now at item number 1C, beginning with presentations to outgoing mayor, and that would be Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Right. Thank you. I, I wasn't sure if you're going to have me speak before the public, but I think that that makes sense. It's kind of like the staff's report. Um, this, this is a presentation for Paul. So Paul is now the second person to serve as mayor while the ongoing pandemic precluded us from meeting in person throughout the entire nine month term. And uh, Mikey was the other person and Karen also served virtually for a, the last few months of her term. Of course, that made an already difficult job of maintaining order and decorum at city council meetings an even more difficult job. Uh, while there have been unavoidable hiccups from time to time, Paul has done an admirable job of running orderly meetings and ensuring that all matters brought before the city council have received a fair and proper airing. Paul also worked diligently behind the scenes, I've seen this, to protect the city's interest in various matters involving outside agencies, and he has consistently been responsive to comments and concerns of the residents, both publicly and privately. He's, he's, he goes out and visits when people have concerns. I've seen that as well. 
Paul did all of this while holding down a full-time job. I suspect he may be somewhat exhausted at this point. Tonight, I have the honor as Mayor Pro Tem of presenting Paul with a small token of the city's appreciation for his public service as the city's mayor over the past nine months. I understand that's been delivered to you, Paul, um, prior to tonight, you, you should have it there. It's both a pleasure and a challenge to be the public face of Malibu. And Paul, you did so with dignity and honor. And for that, we thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, I see it's just walked in the door. So reaching into the magic bag. And I don't know if anybody can see it, but it says with deep appreciation for outstanding service and dedication as mayor of the city of Malibu, 2021-2022, and it's signed by the other council members. And I thank you very much. Hey, that takes us to remarks. Uh, Mayor Grisanti, we do have some members of the public who signed up to give presentations. It's possible they also wanted to speak um, on the election of the mayor. Would you like to hear all of those comments after your remarks, or would you like to hear the ones that signed up for presentations now? Let's do the ones who signed up for presentations. Okay, then our first speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Joseph Patterson and Josh Siegel. Hi, it's Joe. I just wanted to um, mainly speak for the election of the mayor, which will be the next item. So I'll wait for that. But congratulations, Paul, and thank you for all of you that you do. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. And next we have Joseph Patterson, followed by Josh Siegel and Georgia Goldfarb. Mr. Patterson, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm also, I, I've signed up to speak on, on the next item. So uh, I'll just say, um, yeah, thank you, Paul, uh, for your service. And um, I'll, I'll speak after you're finished. Thank you so much. And next we have Josh Siegel, followed by Georgia Goldfarb and Scott Dietrich. Hi, Josh, are you available? I am, congratulations, Paul. Thank you for everything. Um, I also signed up for the wrong item, so I will uh, speak on 1C3. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next we have Georgia Goldfarb, followed by Scott Dietrich, Rick Mullen, and Dave Porter. Georgia, are you available? Hi. Hi. Oh, great. Okay, good. Um, yes, I too uh, would like to uh, speak on the next item, but I want to thank you for the time that you spent. And uh, I, I think it's a huge job. So, um, yeah, congratulations on doing it and getting through it. Thank you. And next we have Scott Dietrich, followed by Rick Mullen and Dave Porter. Hi, hey, Scott, are you available? I am. Thank you, Paul. And I did sign up for both. Um, so that everyone knows, Paul, I think, spent 14 years on the Public Works uh, Commission and using his knowledge there. And I had the uh, privilege of working with him on that commission. And I know that besides the normal 30 hours a week that you all on the council put in, as mayor, it's even more. And it's a real tribute to all five of you, but to Paul, especially at this time, for the effort that you put in, Paul, that this is someone who volunteers his time. You're not getting rich serving on the city council um, for sure. You really don't get paid. You get a little reimbursement. And, you know, I wish more citizens would participate. And I think you have demonstrated over the years what it really means to be 
that kind of citizen volunteer. So thank you so much for your service. Thank you for the kind words, Scott. And we have Rick Mullen followed by Dave Porter. Hi, Rick. Welcome. Are you available? Rick, you should have a pop-up. There you go. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. I'm also a 1C3 sign up, but I do want to say, Paul, thank you very much for giving so selflessly for so many years to the city of Malibu. You've done a great job and I'll keep my comments brief, but well done. And that's all thank I have to say. And I still want to be a 1C3 guy. Thank you, Rick. I don't see Dave Porter in the meeting. We do have one more sign up, Jaden uh, Soniji. And then everyone who has indicated they like to speak on 1C3, I've confirmed they're on the list. Thank you. Are you available, Jaden? Hello? Yes. Um, so I just, I just, I just wanna say I love the, the Malibu port noise, uh, like the meeting of the Zoom. And um, uh, I was hoping that uh, Malibu can soon open up a Willy Wonka chocolate factory for us to uh, have a like a, a meeting. Like, Thank uh, you, Jaden. No, 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 just like uh, I'm saying for like a nice. Like, Hello. Do we have someone else, please? No, those were all of the remarks okay. to the outgoing mayor. I'd like to make a few brief remarks as the outgoing mayor. And I'm gonna start by thanking the, the rest of the council. And on Valentine's Day to thank all of your spouses as well. Uh, I know that in my life, I would not have been able to continue doing any business at all without my wife being involved. And I know that uh, I've seen your spouses supporting you. And I think it's, uh, it's an incredible part of being a volunteer. You can only be a volunteer if you have someone else to help you. And that, that's been wonderful. Uh, in, the, in the last nine months, I've learned some things that I'd like to share. The first thing I'd like to share is that I think we are, are going to need to make some changes to our, we need, first of all, to have a, an institutional zoning uh, and a set of institutional uh, codes. Uh, we've tried to do the, the uh, Santa Monica City College was done without having codes and there was lots of bending sideways and, and squeezing through loopholes to get that project finally approved. And this, the uh, Malibu High School is having similar problems now. We really need to have an institutional code that, that contemplates from the beginning that we will have institutional buildings. At some future point, we will have lots of input and a future council will decide to do something with some of the vacant land that was purchased by those who came before us. And it will be much more difficult for them to do those buildings for public use if they don't have codes for it. The other thing we need to do is figure out a way to change our existing codes to allow the older buildings that are part of what the Malibu that we are trying to preserve, uh, as those older buildings get older, and they, they become less usable because of statewide and federal codes that come out. Most recently, we have all of the uh, ADA compliance that needs to happen. Uh, so an existing uh, restaurant, for example, that has a second story needs to figure out an ADA compliant way to get uh, uh, patrons to the second story, things like that. One of our problems is that most of these things, by the time you get started on doing it, the most economical way to do it is to take the building down, build something with a modern foundation and a modern septic system, and make it look like the building that came before. And our code doesn't allow that right now. 
and so we find ourselves getting stuck. And this is this is something that uh, wasn't a concern when I was on the general plan task force 30 years ago, because who would know that we'd live this long? So I, I think that that's something that we have to do in planning for the future is figure out how we keep the character of Malibu without uh, forcing owners of buildings we want to preserve into selling them to somebody who's going to do something else entirely and go through that whole process. Uh, and I really have loved the opportunity to be the mayor. I've loved the opportunity to meet with people and respond to them and get a, a more unfiltered view of what people want. And uh, I've had many people write to me. Uh, email has been great for that. And I guess I should be grateful that not nearly as many people decided they wanted to give me a call. Although I do answer the phone call and I've enjoyed uh, the conversations I've had. So thank you very much. And that takes this, I believe, to item 1C3, election of the mayor. And at this point, I guess I have to open the uh, for comments. Mayor Grisanti, since there is going to be public comment on this item before that, we should hear from the speakers if you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, our first few speakers are Lloyd Ahern, Bill Sampson, Ryan, and Rosemary Ives. We do have Lloyd here, so we'll hear from him first. Hi, Lloyd, are you ready? Lloyd, I am asking you to unmute. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Lloyd. Okay, hi. Good evening, uh, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I'm here to speak about uh, the new mayorship. Uh, the job of the mayor of Malibu is to make us look good. Why on earth would we choose Bruce? Surely we know we can do better. My suggestion is Steve Urich. Steve has been running meetings in this town for 23 years. He's been involved in everything. Every time we've come up with um, to a time where uh, Bruce is supposed to be nominated for something, a controversy is all around it. If you take this paper this week in the Malibu Times, he wrote a explanation of what this whole uh, controversy was about. And it went on, you're supposed to have 300 words. It went on for about 3,000. And then at the very end, it said, go to the MalibuTimes.com to read the rest. So I would love, there's an old saying in politics, it was, I got it from John Ferraro at, um, when he was president of the Los Angeles City Council. Be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. And that's something Bruce has got to learn. And I hope tonight that you vote for somebody who can control the meetings, control himself, and make us proud. Please elect Steve Uren, uh mayor tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Bill Sampson, followed by Ryan, Rosemary Ide, and Gerard Ide. Hi, Mr. Sampson. Are you available? Here I am. Uh, we hear first, you. Uh, Kelsey, thank you. I know that this has been on, it has been off, it has been on, it has been off. It must have driven you nuts. Um, I kept trying to sign up for what I thought was right. And finally I have, and I, I appreciate your time. Uh, second, uh, Mikey, if you go and look at the sign up for speaking, there are boxes next to almost all the items and you are permitted to speak on them. I will, I'm sure you'll be glad to learn I did not sign up for very many of them tonight. So you're welcome, Mikey. Next, guys, 2,414 people voted for Bruce to do what he has done. Maybe he talks too much, I, I don't know, so do I. However, you don't like him, obviously, you, you made it look like you hated him. And I'm talking about the three of you, Karen, Mikey, and Paul. Uh, your behavior December 13th was reprehensible, uh, especially since you knew that he'd already been exonerated on the 
uh, gender bias claim. Uh, that just was uncalled for. I don't care if you like him or not. There's 2,414 of us that voted for him. I took it personally when you jobbed him in December of 2020. There was no reason for that. You had jobbed him again in April of 2021. You got a chance to do it right. Do not do it for Bruce. You may find him personally offensive. I'm sure some people do. Boyd does, I guess. And there's, I can see a whole list of hands there that are gonna tell me a bunch of stuff I've heard already. Do it for us. More of us voted for him than for any other count, uh, can, council candidate, excuse me. It's, it, it's our turn. It's only ceremonial, at least give us the ceremony. If the council stays constituted as it is, we're probably gonna lose a lot of votes anyway. I know that, but at least the right guy will be there representing us. Ceremonial for the top vote getter. It's time, you got a chance to do the right thing. It only takes one of you. I think Steve's probably gonna vote for him, I hope. Um, Steve, you'd make a great mayor too. I'll talk about that on 1C4. Anyway, put Bruce where he should have been back a year and a half ago, two years ago, whatever it was, December of 2020. Uh, make it right, not for him, make it right for me and 2,413 other voters. It'll also be right for the citizens. He truly believes he represents us all. He isn't here to rule. He's here to govern. There's a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Ryan, followed by Gerard Ide, Rosemary Ide, and Joe Drummond. Are you available, uh, Mr. Evening. Embry? Good evening. I wanted to say a thank you for what I hope will be the respect for the office that you hold and the city's process to properly institute the high vote getter in the role of Mayor Pro Tem. You already um, reneged on that once. And so we've seen as a city, and I've attended so many meetings in this city, you're not always going to, quote, agree or you're trying to make him behave. No, that's called get behind me and do as I say. That's never going to happen. Um, it never has happened in Malibu that way. So I'm, I'm very uh, disappointed that I think we're going to hear from a lot of folks who want to throw the first stones tonight, make the ad hominem attacks or bring up innuendo and character assassination as was done just back in December. And this is from some people who ran against Bruce and lost in the election. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is and we'll expect it. Um, what's most important, though, is look at Bruce, what he's done. He's been available. He's shown up to the meetings. He's a critical thinker. He's made correct analyses and decisions. And some of these have been important and very detailed things like uh, development uh, in Malibu. And someone just said he was like overly communicative. Well, you know what? Some of the council members in the past, they were just unavailable. Uh, they were not interested um, and so forth. So I think it's a breath of fresh air and definitely transparent. So I don't know what you could want more in a mayor for the city of Malibu than someone who has already exhibited and demonstrated fitness for the position by the work that's been happening for the last year. So thank you, Bruce. We look forward to you serving as mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Embry. Our next speaker is Gerard Ide, followed by Rosemary Ide, uh, Joe Drummond, and Bert Ross. Uh, Mr. Ide, are you available? Rosemary, I'm unmuting your account. I believe you and Gerard are using the same account. Rosemary, you should see a pop-up, ask me to unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. First, Gerhard will donate the three minutes and then I'll get the second three minutes. I believe he had a video to play during his three minutes. Is that what you mean, Rosemary? Correct, correct. correct. And he's right here next to me. 
Okay. You're in anger. You're hearing from a city where the majority appear to be tired of this BS. I agree. I'm exhausted by it. We have real work to do. In my opinion, if you had a true sense, Bruce, of self-introspection on the damage you've done, you would behave with far more character. I suspect you won't, and this whole chapter in our city's history has just been a divisive, destructive, expensive, and toxic giant waste of time. When we have real issues we should be focusing on. To focusing use your talents it. to destroy the city is a real shame for the constituents and the staff. In the ideal oh, world, you would have the decency to resign. But this is the real world, and I don't think you'll do that. It's up to the people of Malibu to decide what should happen. So now hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars have been squandered, and for what? So that Bruce Silverstein could declare that the city had a clean bill of health. What's next? The search for Bigfoot? I'm surprised that anybody took anything seriously in that, in that affidavit, because as I told people, there was with the buildup before Pat. I read it, I'm very disappointed that you know, your attacks on Reva have re resulted in but her go, go leaving. Go find a single time before or after the election that I stated that I believed that the city manager had committed a crime or was corrupt. Find a single instance in which I said All of us voted to hire the law firm to do the, the study of the affidavit. And now half of us are sitting back saying, oh, not me, I, I knew anything about that. Uh, we all did. For me, the most disappointing part of this report, I have, you know, I bet Mikey, you and I were on the planning commission for four years. I thought we worked reasonably well together. We didn't agree on everything, okay? But I don't ever remember us calling each other names, okay? And, you know, look, I, I'm a big boy. I've been called names before, so I'm not going to, you know, lose any sleep over it. But this process, it says, you know, we want to, I'm back to this conversation we had in January when Bruce was trying to, you know, was going to be mayor pro tem. We've got to learn how to, you can't attack each other. That's what they're doing in the national level. You want to relitigate the election? Give me a break. Elections, someone said, oh, it was um, Drew, I believe, about consequences. Well, elections have consequences. The, elect, the, the people of the city spoke. I'm now here. I'm trying to do my job, and you just all want to continue to fight and pick? Fine. Paul, would it be possible to pause this for a moment? I'd, I'd be delighted to if I could. Parker, if you could pause the video, that was the end of Gerard's time. I believe Rosemary might want to play the rest of the video using her time. Could I just speak for one moment? And I think that'd be appropriate, Bruce. I, I thank you, Paul. I, I previously asked the people who support me to please not do this, and I, I'm going to ask you once again. It, it, please reconsider what you're going to do tonight. If you want to speak in my behalf, great. I, I, I welcome that. But there's no need to be speaking against others. Let's 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 speak for who we believe in, and not speak against the people we don't believe in. So, you know, obviously can't stop you from doing what you want to do. I would, I would I'll ask you once again, please, let's not go through this. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Bruce. And the next speaker is Rosemary. Rosemary, I'm asking you to unmute. Let us know if you'd like to play the rest of that video using your time. Yes, I would like to. Please stand up for your constituents. Set the record straight. Stop the cover-ups and attacks and elect Mr. Silverstein to his rightful position of mayor. This is the only way the city and council can proceed in a united positive way. Stop the divisiveness and get the work done needed for residents in particular within the planning department. Bruce will be an asset to guide, guiding the council to follow Malibu's vision and mission statement, which protects all residents and the environment we live in. 
and I hope you all do. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Bert Ross, Terry Davis, and Lonnie Gordon. Hi, Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, Honorable City Council. Now that all required for the Silverstein investigation is out, it is clear that this investigation was not for any necessary legal reasons with regards to Ms. Feldman's allegations, but to try and put Mr. Silverstein in a bad light. The council was advised of Mr. Cotty's and several other councils opinion that the Kanata letter did not allege facts that would support a claim of gender-based discrimination. Also that the disparaging comments and harassment allegations attributed to council member Silverstein among other actions alleged did not meet the standards for legal harassment. It was well known by the people who voted for Mr. Silverstein that he understood Ms. Feldman to not be doing her job and their email interactions proved it to be so. This council was advised as to potential defenses available to the city should litigation arise from Ms. Feldman's allegations, including filing an anti-slap motion and that she would have to waive severance or reputational damage and the long time it takes to prosecute an action through the courts. These should have been considered rather than the huge payoff she received rewarding her for bad conduct and false allegations. It is clear from this investigation that the only acts Mr. Silverstein had to grind on behalf of the people who voted for him was with Ms. Feldman and no other female or male staff member. He treated everyone else on staff with the utmost of respect and courtesy. We did not need an over $31,000 investigation, especially knowing that our city attorneys advised the city council that allegations were false. This was a complete waste of taxpayers' time and money and just a smear campaign against Mr. Silverstein, who only conducts himself to get answers to make the city accountable, which is his duty as an elected official. The investigation also misrepresents that there was a small anti Ms. Feldman residence group. Apparently, one of you council members surmised that this group recruited Mr. Silverstein to help them get rid of Ms. Feldman. However, there is not only a petition of over 4,100 Malibu residents' signatures demanding her resignation, but also video of the whole room booing her at the community meeting in council chambers after the Woolsey fire. So indeed, the investigations missed this fact. It also states that Bruce started his conflict when he felt Riva did not listen to residents concerning or concerns or represent the city well after having a field near City Hall paved over in concrete back in 2019. As stated by another resident, we have solid proof that legal counsel was pushed aside for personal interests and protect the contract employee. Sorry, I lost my ear, but. <laughs> who encouraged paving paradise. These were options listed that would have saved us considerable monies, reduced the collective anger in the community as sides drew lines and a narrative was carefully crafted despite full knowledge that it was false. This Valentine's Day, show the majority of your constituents your hearts, get past your negative feelings, set the record straight and elect Mr. Silverstein to his rightful position as mayor. This is the only way the city and council can proceed in a united positive fashion and get the work done in particular within the planning department in upholding the vision and mission statement. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Bert Ross, followed by Terry Davis, Lonnie Gordon, and Joseph Patterson. Hello, Mr. Ross, are you available? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Eguasani, members of the council. The question before us is whether one's conduct should have any impact on who is selected as our mayor. I believe it should, and the Councilman Silverstein's outrageous and unapologetic behavior, again, without an apology, should disqualify him from serving in that capacity. A recent investigative report found that Councilman Silverstein communicated and conducted himself in a, quote, hostile and unprofessional manner. His response to this most serious charge is that the finding was beyond the purview of the investigation, which it was not. Silverstein seems to find comfort that his unacceptable behavior did not violate the law only because it was not based on gender. In, ex in an exchange with me on Nextdoor, I asked him whether a public official should not be held to a higher standard than, quote, I did not violate the law. Believe it or not, he answered no. Our kids in high school would do better. Silverstein's calling our former city manager a fascist. Not that she, he disagreed with her, but called her a fascist. Absurdly accusing City Hall of scheduling a construction project to somehow deter the vote from Eastern Malibu. Questioning the motivation of three members of this governing body by saying they serve for, quote, the power 
benefits, and personal aggrandizement. All this and much more in little over a year. Bruce, what you said tonight to Paul, you owe him an apology because a year ago you said he was in it for the power, benefits, and the personal aggrandizement. And then, of course, there was Silverstein's preparation of an affidavit signed by Jefferson Wagner charging corruption in City Hall. An affidavit which an experienced attorney like Silverstein must have known was nothing more than hearsay and innuendo. And if you read the report, you were far more than a scrivener. The course of the report by reputable independent attorneys whom Silverstein helped choose himself concluded not only that there was no evidence in corruption in City Hall, but also that the affidavit was not credible for a variety of reasons, including the fact that Wagner and Silverstein couldn't even get their stories straight regarding how the affidavit was created in the first place. Contrary to Silverstein's assertion, the report concludes, quote, far from determining that the city has been plagued by corruption, we believe that the city has been and remains well served by devoted administrators, staff, and civic leaders, close quote. The sad fact is that Councilman Silverstein has almost single-handedly created a cloud of suspicion under which the employees of this city have had to work. Morale is low and staff are leaving in unprecedented numbers. To reward this kind of behavior by making the perpetrator our mayor, the face of our city, defies any logic or common sense. I urge you to make Councilman Uring the next mayor, and if he does not accept the position, then any of you who have already served with distinction should be chosen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Our next Who do we have speaker, next? We have Terry Davis, followed by Lonnie Gordon, Joseph Patterson, and Rick Mullen. Hi, Ms. Davis, are you available? I am. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank Mr. Ross for what he said. It was very, very eloquent. Uh, regarding the Ellis investigation report, although I would have preferred that it had remained private in respect for the agreed upon attorney client privilege, I was also grateful to have read the findings. When I saw that the legal claim of, har of harassment had to be based on a protected category and that gender had been chosen, I knew that Mr. Silverstein would not be found guilty of such, since I believe that his behavior has not been limited to gender or a category. I do believe, though, that the actions taken against Ms. Feldman were harassment. And as stated in the report, it was the case that Mr. Silverstein's communications and conduct toward and about Ms. Feldman were frequently hostile and unprofessional, perhaps not illegal, but hostile and unprofessional. He denigrated Ms. Feldman repeatedly across social media, agreed that he ran on a plan to remove her and others from office, and as asserted by witness after witness, made undue requests of the city manager and other staff. As made clear in his extensive letter, letter to the editor in today's Malibu Times, Council Member Silverstein believes that he was vindicated by these findings. But I believe the ultimate finding is that Council Member Silverstein's behavior has been acerbic, attacking, demeaning, and demoralizing to Malibu City staff. Mr. Silverstein made and supported claims against Ms. Feldman, which were determined by hired counsel to be unsubstantiated. These claims and his behavior led to Ms. Feldman's resignation, facilitating the resignation of other staff, causing a tremendous financial toll on the city, demoralizing staff and employees, and tarnishing the reputation of the city of Malibu. This has severely affected the city's ability to attract a suitable replacement for Ms. Feldman. Council Member Silverstein's abuse of comportment has not been limited to city staff. I have been the recipient of such, not for my gender, but for my critiques of his behavior. I should not be bullied, demoralized, and silenced by an elected representative. Although it is an effective tactic and a tool, as most people do not choose to engage in such conflict. You are an elected official, and what I have to say should be meaningful to you and not dismissed because we disagree. I say this not to denigrate you, Bruce. I, I am not a hater. I say this without vitriol, without anger, and without retribution. I say this because I respect and admire the city staff and council with whom I have worked. I say this because I question whether your behavior is what we want to represent our city and the leadership of our council as mayor, even if only ceremonial. I do hope that you will take the results of this report to heart, that you will revise your behavior, soften your approach, listen more, Harry, and write less. Thank you. Who do we have next? 
We have Lonnie Gordon, followed by Joseph Patterson, Rick Bowen, and Doug Stewart. Hi, Lonnie, are you available? Lonnie, you're unmuted. I've been told that these uh, earphones are not working very well. Let me, let me take it out. Can you hear me at all? We can hear you. Oh, good, <laughs> because I can hardly hear you. So I, I suggest that we all take a nice deep breath to clear the air because there's a lot of vitriol going on here. And mine, mine is short. Um, I respectfully request that there be no further denial by the council that the rightful process to appoint the mayor pro tem, Bruce Silverstein, be implemented tonight. He's shown he's more than capable for this position. And I also want to appreciate the fact that you, Mayor Brasanti, stepped up at, at a time when we needed you for the state on our 5G issues and helped us out at the last minute. That was more than appreciated and so many people said you did such a wonderful job. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. And we have Joseph Patterson, followed by Rick Mullen, Doug, uh, Doug Stewart, and Josh Siegel. Hello, Mr. Patterson. Are you available? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, good evening, Council. As we approach the election of a new mayor this evening, I would like to point out to Council, in case you have forgotten, Bruce Silverstein was elected to City Council by 2,400-plus residents of our city. He received more votes than any other candidate for the position in the 2020 election. Bruce ran on a platform which, among other things, promised to be tough on the then city manager, Reva Feldman, and to try and dispel rumors and or prove or disprove allegations of corruption within our city government. Bruce has delivered on what he promised, and I'm confident that a majority of the residents who voted for him appreciate what he has accomplished thus far in his term. Despite the constant attacks on his character, attempts to discredit him and even remove him from office by other city council members. The past several months of vitriol, false, false insinuations, and outright lies used by some members of council to disparage Bruce, all while knowing that he had been found innocent of what he had been falsely accused of by Reva Feldman is shameful. I would not doubt that there will yet again be Yet again, another attempt to deny Bruce his rightful place as Malibu's mayor this evening by three out of five council members. Your actions are predictable, deceitful, and in direct contrast to what 2,400 plus residents of Malibu voted for. Please do what is right for the city. Vote Bruce and his mayor and stop your petty political games. We see you, we know what you're doing, and we don't like it. In the spirit of transparency, I can tell you that as a resident of Malibu, I'm constantly disappointed by the continued attacks on Councilperson Silverstein, by the council majority, as well as the majority's negligence in defending and upholding Malibu's mission and vision statements. As a voter, I can promise you that I will do all I can to correct this in the year's upcoming election. And finally, to paraphrase uh, and use the words of a couple of our council members from a few weeks back, as our nation faces an unprecedented attack on democracy itself, how can we expect our children to understand and embrace the principles of transparency, accountability, and the right to a fair process when we stand by as a city council majority could consider trampling on these principles of fairness? Thank you and good night. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Good night. Next, we have Rick Mullen, followed by Doug Stewart, Josh Siegel, and Dave Porter. Are you with us, Mr. Mullen? Yes, sir. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and for releasing this latest in a series of expensive and corrosive investigations, which confirm that council members technically legal, council member Silverstein's technically legal harassment of the city manager resulted in not one, but three key city staff members leaving the city. His actions apparently were deemed technically legal. However, this is not a courtroom, this is the real world and the actual real-world effect of his actions have resulted in the following. The departure of the three stellar long-serving city, city employees from the city that I just mentioned. The city paid some $300,000 for, for our stellar 
prior city manager to leave a year early. So we essentially paid for two city managers, but we only had one. And the residents of Malibu picked up that tab. Our city's reputation for how we treat our full-time staff has been possibly irreparably damaged. And that impedes our ability to get top-notch employees now and into the future. The city has wasted time, energy, money, and resources that could have been more properly directed to supporting the residents of the city as a result of the technically legal harassment of our city manager, the Wagner affidavit written by council member Silverstein, and the ensuing investigation, which turned up nothing, the endless Freedom of Information Act requests, which hamstrung and overburdened the city clerk and staff, and this recent harassment investigation, those are the actual results of Council Member Silverstein's actions and behavior. Council Member Silverstein ran on a platform of running the city manager out of town, so he should own that, as well as the collateral damage of the other two excellent professionals leaving and tarnishing the reputation of our city in the eyes of any potential future employees. All of that is a direct result of his actions and behavior, and he should take responsibility for that. Mr. Silverstein's election entitles him to serve on the city council. It does not entitle him to be the mayor. That is decided by the other council members. The mayor of Malibu should have the personality, temperament, and integrity to represent the people of Malibu. Mr. Silverstein, who drove three outstanding, long-serving, and professional city employees out of their jobs before having the common decency to see if his suspicions had any foundation in reality by giving them a chance to work with him, is a reflection of his, and I quote from the closing statement of the harassment investigation, frequently hostile and unprofessional conduct. He is not fit to be the mayor. I think Steve Yearing would be an excellent choice as mayor. Do the right thing, as I know you will. And thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Mellon. Our Good next one. speaker, I'm sorry, we have Doug Stewart, followed by Jeff, uh, Josh Siegel, Dave Porter, and E. Barry Haldeman. And Mr. Stewart, are you available? I am. Uh, Mayor Gasani and the city council members, thank you for allowing the residents to make comments regarding the election of a new mayor and mayor pro tem. I'm Doug Stewart. I'm speaking as a 22-year resident of Malibu. My comments are really aimed at addressing a direct message to council member Silverstein. What I would ask is that he consider removing his name for consideration as mayor or mayor pro tem. Council member Silverstein, it's clear that you wanted the investigation into the former city manager's allegations of harassment against you released to the public as it was recently done. No doubt you felt that you and your apologists could spin this into a story that you were innocent of the harassment claim. I'm the first one to admit that much to my surprise, you were cleared of that allegation of harassment, but only because you were determined to be aiming your bullying at just women, but men too. It looks like you're actually guilty of being an equal opportunity harassment uh, candidate. What was very clear in the report is that you consistently operate in a hostile and unprofessional manner to the city staff and others who you deem worthy of your tactics. The investigator went out of their way to mention hostile and unprofessional about you over 10 times in an only 25 page report. Only the naive could miss the obvious determination of your consistent and offensible attitude. Not being found guilty of a crime is not the same as being innocent, especially in a business or government role. The military will use the phrase conduct unbecoming an officer. An employee performance report will, for someone who is thought to be hostile and unprofessional, would state that they cannot work well with others or be unfit for a leadership role or promotion. For leadership roles such as mayor and being the face of our city, do we really want someone who has the adjectives of hostile and unprofessional now and forever attached to his name? If you were promoted to mayor, do we really want to send the message that our city condones such hostile and unprofessional attitudes to be our style of leadership, the management, and the way we treat the public? Don't ask to be named mayor, and please stop the seemingly never-ending transactional chaos that you continue to put the city through. And in the end, I'd like to say that I strongly support Steve Uring for mayor. I think he'd make a great uh, mayor. He's got a lot of experience, and we all like him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. And next we have Josh Siegel, followed by Dave Porter, E. Barry Haldeman, and Georgia Goldfarb. Mr. Spiegel, are you available? 
Yes, I am. Good evening, council and staff. Uh, I haven't been able to carve out uh, some time to speak over the last couple of months as my beautiful wife and I recently had another daughter and she's been keeping us busy in the evenings. Tonight, much to the chagrin of my wife on Valentine's Day, I was able to negotiate a few minutes to speak. Um, first things first, I'd like to offer a public apology to Jay Katz. I made a comment that I regret. Though it's late, I'd like to offer my sincere apology. And Jay, if you're listening, I still owe you that bottle of wine. I didn't forget. Now, I'd like to address the main issue tonight. I don't believe Bruce Silverstein is fit to be a city council member, let alone mayor. I know there are a lot of people in this community that support Bruce. There are even some that support his hostile treatment of our previous city manager. For those people, the ends justify the means. Bruce ran his campaign on getting rid of Reva. I think most people would agree that Bruce is a very smart guy. He knew coming in that there wouldn't be enough votes to fire her. So he concocted a plan to overwhelm her, torment her, be hostile, and generally make her job virtually impossible. He knew the legal definition of harassment and made sure to go to that line, but not cross it in an effort to unilaterally get rid of her. Sadly, many people in this town, including some that are speaking tonight, don't understand the difference between illegal and immoral. No, city, no single city council member has the right to force our city manager out. This un-American act by a lone elected official should preclude him from being the face of our city. In the last year or so, we have seen many high-level staff members leave for greener pastures. We have a planning department that is completely overwhelmed. And as a result, Woolsey fire victims are forced to wait weeks before they can meet with a planner or staff member. Bruce has alienated so many staff members, which has led to an all-time low in morale at City Hall during the most crucial period in our history. Bruce has cost this city and its residents more than just the hundreds of thousands of dollars paid to Reva or paid to investigate the laughable Wagner affidavit that he himself drafted. Bruce is currently costing us all much, much more. Ordinarily, this agenda item would take 10 minutes and you'd be on to other things that would benefit the citizens of this community. The last year, in every commission, we are asked to hold off on some important agenda items. This is because the city council is forced to deal with the messes this quote jerk has made. I implore the city council to consider another council member who has the best interests of this community in mind to be mayor. Thank you. And Kelsey, please take me off to it. And our next speaker, I don't see Dave Porter in the meeting, so we'll move on to E. Barry Haldeman, followed by Georgia Goldfarb and Walter Zellman. Mr. Haldeman, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you, Paul, for being a dignified, businesslike, and caring mayor. I think you can be proud of the work you did, and the city is much better for it. Um, I was here when the city was formed. We were excited that we could get away from the nastiness of county politics and have a comfortable and positive city to live in. In all the time since then, I have never seen such disruption in the city as now. The city manager was driven out. The city attorney who was going to slow down was driven out. Multiple staff have left. I've never seen anything like this. And unfortunately, it started with Bruce's campaign. What we need to do is repair the city, not further divide it. And I don't believe Bruce is the right person to do that now. As I told Bruce personally, the best litigators don't make the best deal makers. Warriors don't always make the best governors. There's a different set of skills involved. And I believe Bruce has to spend more time on his people skills before we let him be the face of Malibu. I agree that he was found not guilty of sexual harassment, but even without a report, we all know from his actions, he is guilty of harassment. On next door, Bruce was asked if he felt as a public official, he should be held to a higher standard. His answer was no. The only standard he has to speak uh, to break is not to break the law. The rest is subjective. 
that's not what a potential mayor should respond. Someone who for the next nine months will be in many cases speaking for Malibu. Being on the city council and certainly being mayor involves more than just interpreting and arguing the law and not breaking it. It's about making us proud to be in Malibu, about setting an example. It's about when to hold them and when to fold them. And very importantly, it's about representing all the people in the city. I'm not saying Grace Bruce should never be mayor. I'm just saying he has a lot to learn before he is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haldeman. Who do we have next? We have Georgia Goldfarb, followed by Walter Zellman, Andrew Wayman, and Colleen Baum. Georgia, are you available? Yes. <clears throat> we can hear you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, oh, wrong document. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, I strongly urge you to follow protocol and vote for council members Silverstein as mayor and Steve Hearing as mayor pro tem, as has, to my knowledge, always been done. Excuse me, I have to close the door because there's echo here. My apologies, we were both listening to this in different rooms. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, please vote for so Council Member Silverstein as mayor and Steve Uring as mayor pro tem, as has, to my knowledge, always been done. They are eminently qualified and have been articulate and fair members of the council, as well as representing the majority of the voters in Malibu. It is well past time to put any conflictive personal differences behind us. Please let us move forward in a respectful and collaborative mode. There are many critical problems, many to address in Malibu. We must not let our personal differences interfere with our duties as citizens and your responsibilities as our elected representatives. Please elect Council Member Silverstein as mayor and Steve Hearing as mayor pro tem. Thank you for your consideration for Malibu. Thank you, Ms. Goldfarb. And next we have Walter Zellman, followed by Andrew Wayman, Colleen Baum, and John Mazza. Can you hear me, Mr. Zellman? Walter, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, I am. Okay, we now. Hear you. Okay. Many years ago as a student at the University of Michigan, I took my first class in political science. The professor was George Peake. And he said, and I never forgot it, a sign of a healthy democracy is that all sides can live with losing. A sign of a democracy in danger is that large numbers of people can't live with losing. I thought about this at that time as a partisan ideological question. Democrats and Republicans can't be so far apart that one side can't live with the other winning. But years later, as I became the director of Common Cause in California, I saw this more as a matter of process than partisan ideology. If people don't believe the process is fair, people can't live with losing and they can't, and democracy suffers. I fear a touch of that is going on before us today. President protocol suggests one thing, that Bruce Silverstein be elected mayor. But some of you may feel that the rules of precedent can be ignored or bent to make something else happen. We have enough of this in our national politics today. If it happens, we would be sending our own message that precedent and process can be changed whenever you have the votes. Lower levels of public confidence in systems and processes in Malibu will be one certain result. Living with losing will become a lot harder. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zellman. Our next speaker is Andrew Wayman, followed by Colleen Baum and John Mazza. Hi, Mr. Wayman, can, are you available? Yes, I'm here. You can hear me okay, I take it? We, we can hear you. Great, thanks so much for the opportunity to comment. Uh, much of Council Member Silverstein's behavior towards others has simply been unacceptable. His few emails with me have included accusations and name calling. He's a duly elected official but his behavior would not well represent our city if he serves as mayor. We deserve better. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wayman. Our next speaker is Colleen Baum, followed by George uh, John Maza. Hi, Ms. Baum, are you available? I don't actually see Colleen in the meetings. So we'll see if we're able to circle back to her in a moment, and we can hear from John Maza now. Hi, John, are you available? Uh, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, I think we can all see where this is going. Uh, everybody on the pro-development side is saying, oh, don't elect Bruce, uh, elect Steve, knowing full well that Steve has the integrity not to take the job. So one of you three is going to elect yourselves. Now, I think you want to look at the way the national politics is going. Everybody's anti-Trumpian, there's fake news, this and that. But what have you done? The first action you took was to take the clear winner of the election and deny the mayoralship to them. Then you came up with a Tuesday afternoon attempt to get rid of this council uh, policies. Uh, fortunately, the, the citizens stopped you. That, but that was a takeover. That was a coup. Then you, invent, you had this report on Bruce's actions, which you knew in July was before you voted to pay Reva, you knew he had been exonerated. And then you paid Reva $300,000 to leave when it was unnecessary and blamed Bruce for it. Uh, when your counsel told you, she had no claim in her letter. Then you came in on December 13th and lied through your teeth about what happened and attacked Bruce. Most of your speakers say, oh, Bruce, is, Bruce attacked this, attacked that. Go look at that meeting on December 13th. You attacked Bruce and you lied. And everybody knows it. And it's there to see as long as we're a city. So what should happen? Okay. The voters voted overwhelmingly for Steve and Bruce. We have an election in November. Uh, hopefully power will change. If we follow the supposed Trumpian policies, uh, you may not accept that, but it, ha it will happen. So what should they do, the new city council? Should they have a February 14th investigation and have Bruce and Steve run it? Just like the, the Democrats are doing now? Should, should uh, we have a city that follows democracy or should we listen to all the pro-development toadies that come up here and say, oh, Bruce is terrible and you guys are wonderful? No, we should follow democracy. This is our town, not your town. And we need to straighten it out and get back to normal and have you quit attacking each other, especially the three of you who use lies and city funds to do it and bring us back to normalcy and fix some of the problems the city have, which are tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazza. And Mayor, looking at the raised hands now, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich next. Hi, Scott. Are you available? Thank you, Paul. Um, so I guess we're rehashing the last election, and I find this really unfortunate because, as a number of people have mentioned on both sides, we have a lot of problems in this city. Um, for example, they want to declare uh, a, a new mean high tide, which will get rid of all our beach houses. That's not good. MRCA wants to take over the canyons on private roads, on and on and on, homeless pirates. If we're divided, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. Bruce and Steve, but Bruce particularly, ran on a platform of getting rid of Reva and getting rid of Christy Hogan, the city attorney. Now, some people love Reva. That's okay. But that was Bruce's platform, and he ran on it. And then he proceeded to do it. And what did Reva do? Reva fought everything he tried to do in requesting legitimate information. That was wrong. And it got ugly. Okay, we all saw that. So what happens next? Oh, people want to cancel. Bruce, this is cancel culture. Do we want this in Malibu? 
or do we want to allow those 2,400 people who voted for him to see democracy in action and see him as mayor? 4,000 people signed a petition. I was one to get rid of Riva. Why? I'll give you two examples because I want to make it really clear why she needed to go. We spent five years at our neighborhood to underground utilities. <clears throat> Riva, at the end of five years, said, oh, you cannot do an assessment district that made it feasible for us to do this. That was a complete lie. Um, she said, you have to do a community development district. And that was just ridiculous. Why? Because suddenly the assessment engineer that it took five years to get and we paid for out of our pocket said, oh, there's a public com component. If in fact you do get rid of these poles because it's going to save in terms of fire danger. And Reva didn't want to spend any money on this. It was her agenda. She had her own agendas. And last, Reva, oh, she cost the city $3 million when we bought City Hall because she completely blew it. I won't go into the details, but we need, if we're going to be anything credible, to elect Bruce as mayor and Steve as mayor pro tem. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mark Bowdy and Colleen, I see you keep submitting your name, but I don't see you in the meeting under that name. If you could contact staff, we'd be happy to, happy to help you get connected. Mr. Bowdy, are you available? I am, can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect, thank you, Kelsey. I'm, <laughs> I'm driving west on the 10. So the issue here is uh, not one of law. The council has the flexibility to appoint as mayor anyone that they think is credible, honest, and forthright. The difficulty you have here is Bruce's first act as mayor was to perpetrate a fraud in which he did not reveal that he was the drafter, author, if you will, of the Wagner affidavit. And that affidavit was designed to help him achieve a campaign objective of ending Reva Feldman's career. He wasn't forthright about that. If you look at the background of this lawyer, and this is an area where I'm gonna to have to disagree with Barry, this is not a skilled lawyer. This is a lawyer who didn't and has never tried a case. His career ended because he got involved in a sunken treasure fraud and a federal judge found him to have intimidated witnesses, mislead his clients he and his law firm were sued over it they had to cash out all of the investors who were taken advantage of and his career was over that's how he ended up in malibu you now have sociopathic pathological liar and a narcissist on your city council the fact that <laughs> over 2,000 people in a pandemic who never met him voted for him because they thought we needed a lawyer doesn't surprise me, but it doesn't mean that you should make the mistake of having someone this rude and abusive to staff be your mayor. You need to man up as a majority. Any one of the other four of you can be a viable mayor. The city right now in terms of morale and personnel turnover is at an all-time low, and it's specifically because of the unfortunate pandemic, which resulted in nobody meeting this guy, electing one of the least ethical, in fact, outright unethical lawyers I've ever seen to the city council. Now you're stuck with him, but you can't have him be the voice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowdy. And our Do next we have... speaker, we have raised hands still to hear from, we have George Hennon. I'll ask him to unmute now. Mr. Hennon, are you available? George, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. If he's unavailable, we can move on to Alexander Stein. Mr. Stein, are you available? Uh, 
Alexander, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. And if he is also unavailable, we can move on to Louis S. Louis, are you available? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, uh, yeah. I, my name is Louis Silverstein, and Bruce is actually my father. Uh, I would just like to say that I've known him my entire life, and I have never once observed him harassing or treating anyone unfairly. All he has ever done in my entire life for observation has asked for people to be accountable to what they do, say, and are asked to do. I have also heard allegations this evening of him saying, of people saying that he has name called. I would love in writing to see any of these things materialize because, again, I've known this man for 35 years of my life. And I have never once heard him call names of somebody, denigrate them, or be anything but respectful, but holding them accountable. So if anybody that has spoken tonight that has said that he has called them names, I, I, I urge you to please publish it because otherwise it is nothing but hearsay. I, I, I just, I find all of this unbelievably fascinating because it just seems like I'm watching high school politics. I, I think that the city of Malibu voted. There was an election. There is protocol. And the fact that it is not being um, respected, just it just looks to me like national politics on a smaller scale. And, you know, I, I know that when the next election happens, people of Malibu will speak. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lewis. And Mayor Grisanti, I don't see Dave Porter or Colleen Baum in the meeting under those names or any uh, raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. Bruce, I see your hand name raised. What a shock. Lewis, thank you so much. That that meant more to me than anything I've, I've heard from anyone else. Not that I don't appreciate everyone who spoke um, in, my, in my support and, and in my favor and who've been supportive for the past for, over for the past year. I'm not going to respond to all the specific comments that were made, um, even generally, except for one. I, I just there, there's a there's a concept called uh, transference, or um, maybe, maybe it's another word. When you look, when you look at something and you see yourself, and, and and I just have that directed to Mr. Balti, sociological, pathological liar and narcissist, unethical lawyer. Look it up. Just do the research. You'll find it. I've talked about it before. Inclu includes berating children. Um, but thank you all of those people who spoke on my behalf. I really do appreciate it. The rest of you, we've heard the exact same thing from you over and over and over and over again. Not anything new. And we'll see what happens. This could be very interesting. Thank you, Bruce. If there's no other comments from the council, I'd like to open the nominations, open the floor for nominations. I'm supposed to say the floor is now open for nominations for mayor. Karen, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Paul. I do have comments. Okay. Uh, I read the report twice. I'm sure many people watching and listening in this meeting did as well. So I want to say, sorry about my dog. The report by investigative attorney Leslie Ellis speaks for itself. Bruce Silverstein and or his conduct is described by Miss Ellis as well as those interviewed in the following terms. Hostile, unprofessional, frequently aggressive, contentious, distrustful, unfriendly, challenging, disturbing, combative, burdensome, demanding, a constant barrage, crackpot conspiracy theories, 
unrelenting, unprecedented, egregious, harsh, and critical. Those are not my words. Those are found throughout the report. While this behavior was not found to be within the legal description of gender-based harassment, it is classic bullying. There's a reason schools have anti-bullying policies and programs. Even children are trained to understand that people deserve to be treated civilly, including those we disagree with. A bully sends a message, even to those he or she does not target. It's a message of intimidation. What the bully is demonstrating is what he or she is capable of. And what is understood is that the object of that treatment is subject to change. This is not behavior that serves any organization well. I'm as sorry as anyone to see this city in its state of contention and dysfunction. And this is why I am unable to support Bruce Silverstein being elected mayor this evening. Thank you, Karen. I see Steve's hand is raised. Would you like to make a nomination, Steve? I'm going to nominate Bruce Silverstein. And let's get over this Tong War, guys. This is like nuts. Okay. Uh, Council Member Silverstein is nominated for mayor. Are there further nominations for mayor? I don't see any other hands. I will nominate Steve Uring. I now have a nomination for Steve Uring for mayor. Are there any other further nominations? There appear to be no further nominations, so I'm going to close nominations and ask the clerk to call the roll. Mikey has his hand up. I'm sorry, Mikey, you need to change the color of your background or something. Mikey, you're, I'm sorry. It's not fine. I have tried to fix this background. It's just, there's something going on. So sorry about that. <clears throat> I, wow. I need to make some comments here. This is just, this is just continues to be so disheartening to me. I have spent days thinking about being here at this moment and hearing the speakers i hope the speakers on both sides can realize that it's just so to me i no wonder it's hard to find people good people to run for city council why would anyone want to be in the middle of this it's horrifying and i listen to the speakers and thank you to all the speakers but it's clear there's just no middle ground for anybody we're just it's just it's really sad you know you you know whoever whatever view you have somebody else is corrupt somebody else is you know has no morale no morals uh, lies corruption you know somehow i'm pro development from several speakers Thank you, Walter, John. I mean, I am really. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just, I had a whole thing written up to talk about. And I'm just going to short circuit because, I mean, I, I think we've all heard enough. This is painful. I think the bigger point is and I guess I'll speak right to you, Bruce. And how do we go forward? I mean, if how do we go forward right now with you as mayor with how just the amount of angst and passion on both sides it brings up? I've never, I've never been a part of anything like it. It's really unbelievable. It's crazy. It's overwhelming. It's amazing. So if we vote for you or don't vote for you, it's just World War III. Is that is that what we want? 
I don't hear, I don't hear any middle ground. And it's just really, it's got to be just so disheartening to so many people. But I also, I want to say three things. What I spent all weekend, and a lot of people got a hold of me, a lot of people, was thinking, how do we get through this? How do we move beyond? And I know one thing. I want to ask you, Bruce, to work with me on a project. And we've talked about what projects can we work on together, right? I want to work on this PCH safety proposal along the lines of what Lance brought up, because I heard you say that it had some merit potentially. So I want to ask you if we can, it's a really difficult project worked on in the past, it's, it's hard. But if you want, maybe we can go up to, I'm gonna go up to Sacramento for the legislative tour early March. If you feel it's safe enough yet, I know it's an iffy call maybe, come up there and let's make some appointments and talk to some people. That's my first idea. If we can't make the legislative tour, so be it. Because we agreed working on projects that impact the city of Malibu positively is probably the best thing we can do. I think most people know by now that you and I speak weekly, pretty much weekly, weekly-ish. And uh, something I asked you to do and you readily jumped on. So, you know, I think we've shown we're trying to figure it out. But I'll tell you this right now, I have no desire to be mayor instead of you, <laughs> zero. So I'm just going to say it out loud now. I'm not going to be mayor at any point until after you are, okay? I, whatever power I'm after or whatever, it's not like that. And the last thing I'll say is I hope we continue our weekly meetings and commit to focusing on how we move forward successfully. But this is a mess. This this is a giant mess, and I th I hope people on all sides can see it. This is this is not right. This is, <sighs> and I will be bringing forward a motion for my item at the next meeting that the council I hope considers and I hope agrees to hire an outside firm to come in and help us become a more effective team. We need help. We are not where we should be. We are not serving the residents of Malibu properly. There's so much to be done. The staff needs our support. The apartment heads need our support. We need to be better than this. I've said this before. So I'm going to bring that forward, but I, I don't see how. I want you to be mayor. I just don't see how it makes sense now. This is, it just creates World War III. And I'm, and for all the reasons on both sides. So I'm going to just say everyone's right, because I don't know what else to say. And that's where I land right now. Thank you, Mikey. Steve, I think you're next, followed by Bruce. My friends, Mikey wants to fix it. Mikey, the only people who are going to fix it are going to be us. We have engaged in a full out tongue war, all right? And we do it anytime Bruce has got a chance to get some recognition. And that result of that tongue war you saw tonight, we've created the Hatfields and McCoys in our residence. They're feeding off this process that we're doing up here. It's our fault. It's our fault that we're acting like high school kids as opposed to sitting down and saying, look, our job is to, is to get along and make this thing work. We, you know, how many meetings have we had since Paul got nominated mayor? And how many meetings have we been able to effectively work on issues, get 5-0 votes to get them done? Make, we've demonstrated we can do that. It, when it comes, it, it comes to this, it comes to a group of people who are so upset that Reva got let go that they can't get over it. Sorry, she's gone. It's done. Right now, our job is to move forward, to take the community, get the community behind us, make sure they understand that this process of fighting with each other 
it's, it's it's nuts. This is not what we were voted in to do. We've got enough issues to take care of without playing these high school games. So I encourage you all to sort of just take a deep breath, look inside, okay, and vote for the residents, not for us. He got the votes. He had more people speaking in his favor tonight than he had people speaking against him. You can listen to the minority, all right? And use that as your basis for making your decision. Or we can do the right thing. And the right thing is to vote him in because that's what he deserves. Paul, go ahead. Bruce has got his hand up. So Bruce is on. You know, there's a there's a famous movie. It's probably a book before that, 12 Angry Men. Pretty much tonight, what you heard was 12 Angry Men and Women. That was it, though. You heard 12 Angry Men and Women. And we've got a city of six to 8,000 voters and 2,414 of them voted for me and a little more than 12 not angry men and women came in and spoke on my behalf. Uh, but 12 angry men and women came in, basically you're saying, oh, that's the city, that represents the majority will of the city and that represents everyone out there. It doesn't, but if you wanna play like that's the case, you're my guest, can't do anything about it. Any event, uh, I'm not gonna, plead for um, what ought to be done, what's right. I'm not going to ask you to do what's right. You know what's right. You know what's not right. Let's just vote. I hear a call for the question, so I believe it's appropriate to vote now. Kelsey, can you take the roll, please? Yes, I'll, I will call each council member's name, and you should state the name of the council member you're voting for. There are two nominees, Bruce Silverstein and Steve Uring. Council member Fair? Steve Earing. Council Member Pearson. Steve Earing. Council Member Earing. Bruce Silverstein. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. I'm not going to vote on this. You're abstaining from the vote. I am. And Mayor Grisanti. Steve Earing. Council uh, Council Member Earing has been elected mayor. Council member Uring is, is declining that position. We've done this before, guys. When are we going to grow up? We've done this. All right. I, I just, I feel like we're not hearing the combined group here. And I know we've all you heard. No, Mikey, what we're hearing is from, there were, what, nine people who spoke against Bruce. And you're using that as a basis to, to trash this guy. That, I'm not, that I'm not trying is, to trash Bruce. You are trashing him, Mikey. That whole process that says you got to do this because I want you to look. He's got as much right to be mayor as anybody else. And for, and to not, I'm not taking this city council position because that's wrong. That's wrong to deny somebody the what they've earned. And to we're like back in high school. This is high school stuff, right? I don't like him, so I'm going to not vote for him. Even though he deserves it, he may be more, more qualified than all of us to do this job. And we're going to say, no, 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 I don't like him. There's nine people that spoke against him, and they don't like him. And I'm going to, I'm going to go with them, ignoring the people that did vote for him. Uh, so, however, I get to decline this position, I officially decline it. It's twice you've declined it, Bruce. Yeah, so, um, you know, look, this is all an interesting kabuki theater charade because everyone knew coming into tonight that you're going to nominate and vote for Steve and Steve's going to decline. So you, you graciously said you'll vote for Steve and you did, but you knew that wasn't going to fly because Steve's above it. He's a, he's a gracious guy and he's not going to stand for that. So that leaves Paul, Mikey, Karen. Paul's not going to take a second term in a row that you, I, I couldn't imagine that. Mikey said he's not going to take a second one in 12 months, and I wouldn't think he would. So it comes down to Karen, which is what, I mean, I game this out weeks ago. I've been talking to people. Everyone knows that's what's going to happen. Everyone I know, talk to, knows that's exactly where it's going. And Karen will have to decide whether she's got the grace to turn it down or whether she'll vote for herself to change it. Let's vote. Are you nominating Karen? No, I'm not, but I'm sure one of you will. So go ahead. Karen, I see your hand raised. 
Add gas, Bruce. I guess you've been taking bets on, on what I'm going to do here. No bets. I'm, I'm not interested in being mayor. I would like to nominate Paul. And I would like to nominate Steve again and ask him to reconsider. Thank you, Paul. It's not going to happen. Do the right thing. Do take a deep breath. Do the right thing. Demonstrate to the community that we all have got some level of courage and honesty amongst us. And hopefully that will start changing this community, this comments that we get every meeting, right? We we are we have created the problem. We've created it. And we continue to fuel it. So let's stop and let's just make this thing right. Steve, do you think that the city will be happier with you as mayor or me? I think the city will be happy with Bruce as mayor. That's what that's what the city wants. 2,400 people said that's what they want. And, and, you know, more people tonight said that's what they want. So who are we listening to? Several people said you, they wanted you. I understand. You know, that, that, that'll come. That will come. That will come in its time. I think the time is now. I don't think it is. I think it's time for us to demonstrate to the community that we're adults, that we can work together, that we're not going to we're not going to deal high school politics and use that to look. We have got more stuff to do in this city. You can shake a stick at with. All right? And correct. instead of working on that, we're playing this high school. This is crazy. I didn't join the city council to play this kind of stuff. I joined this to, to try and do something right for the city. I was hoping you joined it to be the mayor at some point. Some point. Not that this is not that some point. Bruce? Okay, so I, I get it. It, it. it would be politically unwise for Karen or Mikey to do it. They're going to be up for re-election. Paul, it's, it's up to you. Do you want to take it or not? Because Steve's not taking it. You've all voted against me. Karen and Mikey say they're declining. So you want to take it or do you not want to take it? Well, I'm in a corner, aren't I? So let's you're call it. You're actually it. only in a corner if you make it your corner. You're in a corner that's going to test your character, Paul. That's the corner you're in. Right. Steve, you've, re you've refused it. You're going to test. Twice. This is going to test your character, Paul. So just be aware of that. When you, whatever decision you make, this is a test of your character. So go ahead. You're not, you're not actually helping here. Do you know that? I mean, this is just, you're just another symptom of the infighting that's going on. Oh, uh, Mikey, come on. You know, look, I have not been, I have not called anybody names. I have not fought with each other, okay? I've not done that for a whole year and a half I've been on the city council. So don't take me through that path. I wanted, I think our job is to do the, is to demonstrate to the community that we can work together, that we're adults, that we're gonna, we're gonna do the things that we have to do to move the city forward and let this petty tongue war that we're having go away someplace else. That's so, what I think. So is electing someone that's obviously so controversial the way to do that? That's my only point. I want Bruce to be mayor. I don't see that the city is ready, and certainly not from what I heard this weekend and, and from the input I'm getting. Who, I don't, who in the city I says we're not I ready, Mike? Who this, are the people that are telling you he's all right. not ready? Oh, oh, come if on. I had a guess, okay, I we have a motion. Can we move ahead, please? Oh, man. All right. <laughs> Kelsey, will you call the roll, please? Wait a minute. We're, we 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 haven't agreed to call the question, and I'm not even sure there was a motion. There was. Well, yes, there's two nominations on the floor right now. Okay, well. What would you like to say, Bruce? I would like to say, this is the last thing I'm going to say about this. Everything that was rehashed tonight, everything that people came in and complained about is about what happened during the election and in the first two months or three months of the term. Uh, the investigation went on, the two, two investigations went on after that, but nothing changed on the ground. No, there was no further problems that were being asserted or being investigated. Uh, so, you know, yeah, you got this report. People can disagree as to whether it exonerated me or excoriated me. 
but it's a report about things that happened a year ago. And to the best of my knowledge, people aren't saying those things are happening now. They're not saying they've been happening for the past six months. Um, same thing with the Jefferson Wagner piece. That occurred in December of last year. I'm sorry, not December, last year, December of a year and a, of the year before last. And nothing's changed since then that's been new. So you've got a bunch of people who are just holding on to their anger and can't let it go. And I guess it was stoked by a new report. Um, as I've told Mikey, I, I'm not a person that believes in looking back with regret or resentment for things that happened in the past. Because the past is the past and the past was shaped by all the events that were occurring at that time. Uh, and I've been asked to apologize. I'm not going to apologize for what I did for the same reason that I don't look back and regret it or resent it. But I'm not proud of that report. If anyone thinks I'm proud that the Ellis report came back and says I was hostile and unprofessional, um, I don't know where they would get that from. I've never suggested that and I'm not proud of it. I don't agree with the conclusion, but I'm not proud of that conclusion. Um, but I've learned a lot in the last year, and I think I've exhibited that over the past three to six months, as a number of the people who spoke on my behalf have said. Uh, so I, I really just don't get this. I, again, there's, 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 Steve said it was nine people. I thought it was 12 people, but there's a bunch of people who come and they complain about things that are ancient history at this point, water over the dam, and you're going to make decisions based on that? Okay, well... So I, if there's a motion, I didn't realize there was a motion, but I guess if there's a motion now, I'm, I'm done speaking and I'm ready to have the question called. There's two nominations on the floor. Kelsey, will you take the roll again? Yes, as I understand it, there are two nominations for Paul Grisanti and Steve Urien as mayor. Again, I'll call each council member's name and you should state the name of the person you're voting for. Council Member Fair? Paul Grisanti. Council Member Pearson? Paul. Council Member Uring? Bruce Silverstein. Council Member Uring, Bruce Silverstein was not a nominee in this round. And I'm, abs I'm abstaining. And Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? If these are the choices, I'm voting for Steve Uring. And Mayor Grisanti? Well, I'm tempted to vote for Steve Urine and then beg him to change his mind. <laughs> is that pop? Is that one of the options? You can vote for Councilmember Urine. At that point, it would be a split vote. I'm going to vote for Steve Urine. Okay, and with that, uh, the vote is two-two, so the motion fails and you should open the floor for nominations again. The floor is now open for nominations for mayor. I'll nominate Bruce Silverstein. This Thank is you, comical. Steve. Do we I have any other Paul nominations? Do we have any other nominations? I'm gonna close the, Steve, your hand is raised. I'm yeah, sorry, was Paul, my... was my nomination heard? I'm not sure. Your nomination was heard. Thank you. Currently, we have nominations for Bruce Silverstein and Paul Grisani. Can we call the roll, please? Council Member Fair? Paul Grisani. Council Member Pearson? I think we're in the theater of the absurd right about now. Uh, we are. I mean, is there a point where we just we call uncle or something. It's just deadlock. Vote, please. Who are the nominees again? Me or Bruce? I'll vote for you, Paul. Thank you. Steve, I believe you're next. Is Bruce. that correct? Bruce Council Silverstein. Member. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. I'll vote for myself this time. Mayor I'm going to vote for myself. So we, I am the next mayor. Yes, Congratulations, Paul. Mayor. All right. I'll make a motion for Bruce for Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor uh, Grisanti, we do have public comment for the election of the Mayor Pro Tem, if you're ready to hear that. Certainly. 
Our first speaker is Bill Sampson, followed by Ryan, Dave Porter, and George Hennan. Mr. Sampson, are you available? I am. Steve said it correctly, Paul. You painted yourself into a corner. You showed your utter lack of character. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. And our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Dave Porter and George Hennan. Mr. Embry, are you available? Yeah, it's very, it's very disappointing to see the council not respect the city's processes and procedure and choosing to politicize this and open it up to the public discord and try to, I don't know, hold the, the last election over again. Uh, it's it's a demonstration of power is what the three votes are doing. It's quite clear. It's not that you want to do the right thing. It's that you see you can do what you can get away with and you just did it. And you you did it before last time too. So, you know, the public's watching and can see this. In fact, the public's been watching Bruce and knows that what you just did was just for show. It's there was no substance behind it. Sorry, Mikey, but I mean, look at the last nine months. Um, as I said previously, you're not gonna agree on everything, I know that, but you've been able to respectfully work through the issues of the city. And so for Mikey in particular, how disappointing for you to defer to the loudmouths uh, who are obviously brought into this meeting, not the ones who come to the meetings on a regular basis and contribute, but the ones that like to get politically involved because I guess the election just started. Um, I, I could go on, but I think everybody knows what kind of a joke this has been so far, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor Grisanti, I don't see Dave Porter or George Hennan in the meeting, so we'll move on to Alexander, followed by Joe Drummond, Scott Dietrich, and John Mazza. Alexander, are you available? Yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I just had to say, Paul, just the fact that you would actually consider yourself the mayor when it's so clearly Bruce's spot. I mean, it's actually embarrassing. The way you guys are conducting yourself, I think Steve describes it as high school. This is exactly how my student council was ran because they didn't want the most popular person to be the president of the student council. And this is the same thing. Bruce is qualified for this. You know that you, we're wasting so much time and energy going back and forth voting meticulously in a way that you know that the outcome is going to end up in your favor because Steve is not going to take it. And you know that that Mikey and, and Karen, they're all cowards. And you know who the biggest coward happens to be? The person that would sit there and accept it when you know that that is not your position. So I don't even mean this personally. This is a person that I don't even know you from Adam. This is my first night actually finding out about the Malibu city politics. And it is such an embarrassment. Every single person, when they put their head on the pillow tonight, they should be so embarrassed that this is how they conduct city business with city time, doing these personal things, these false allegations on a man that was cleared, on a position that won't even be held along long enough to even make a huge difference. But because you guys are egomaniacs, and what is more important is your personal feelings than that of the city. And so that is what the problem is, is because as an elected politician, you serve the people. The people don't serve you, Paul, but you guys can't understand that, Mickey. You guys, we don't serve y'all. Y'all serve us. Look in the mirror tonight. Who are you serving tonight by doing this high school, junior high charade, kabuki theater, like Bruce said? And listen, Bruce is not a perfect guy, but if you just, uh, if you just judge him on his moral character tonight based on yours, Bruce is a shining star. And Paul, you as the mayor, you should be the one spearheading, let, voting for Bruce, letting him in, but you won't do that because you think that you deserve to have the say. And that shows that you're choosing your ego instead of the interest 
of the true citizens of Malibu. So one day you are going to soon realize how embarrassing this was and how a person like you that has, I guess, would try to consider himself as to having high moral character to have this public embarrassment. And just to do this live on YouTube, on whatever, this is going to go out forever, that you will just be a public embarrassment for the citizens of Malibu. When we have real issues, we have crises in our neighborhood, but you guys want to sit here and create false crises. So you can sit here and go back and forth all day. Yet we have a deadly virus where people are dying. We have issues with our roads. We have issues that are actually important. But once again, your egos take a driver's seat and your mentality is to put the people second and you put yourself in front of us. And I remind you once again, as an elected official, your job is to serve us. Alex, that's your time. Thank you, Alexander. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Scott Dietrich, John Mazza, and Louis Silverstein. Hi, Joe. Are you available? Hi, yes. I mean, this is just wrong. Mikey, you said that Bruce is too controversial to be voted as mayor, but it's you three who have made him controversial. You, Karen, and Paul have called constituents conspiracy theorists. It's embarrassing, exactly what Alexander said. This is just a ceremonial position. There is no power, but it makes a statement. I think, Paul, you should step down as mayor. That's the only way to regain your character and stop wasting time and, yes, create all these false crises. You are putting the residents, we the residents, second. It's true. And it's it's not right what you're doing to Bruce. He, he's, he is... A man of character. He's shown it tonight, and I don't. I do not know why you guys just can't make him be mayor. I just don't understand it. I, I, it's frustrating. It's very upsetting. It's very upsetting, especially on Valentine's Day. It's just no love. There's no love. I don't know what's going on. It's very upsetting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by John Mazza and Louis Silverstein. Hi, Scott. Are you available? Yeah, hi, Paul. You guys blew it. Um, it's really disheartening. You had, I guess, nine people, the usual suspects, some of whom ran for city council and lost, um, hating on Bruce. And when I, when I look at Karen speaking, because I can see her, you all can't see me, the public can't see me. Karen, you, you, you look so unhappy up there, so bitter. And I don't think you've gotten over uh, getting rid of Reva. Now, I think Reva should have been gone when she stood with the fire department chief, Osby, and said what a great job they did. And, you know, she got booed for it. And uh, we lost houses. And uh, but she sided with them and they blew it. We all know that in Woolsey, but y'all like her. That's OK. We can have different opinions on that. But what happened tonight for those of us sitting at home watching on Zoom was horrendous. And it's so sad that you would take that position. Mikey, you waffled. You said nice things, but you waffled. You did. And, I mean, I get, Karen, you really don't like Bruce. Fair enough. That's okay. Um, Paul, you shouldn't have taken the position. Um, I, it's it's really, really disheartening what happened tonight. And, uh, you know, I don't know how we come out of this. Oh, one other thing. A couple of the speakers said, you know, Reva left to know good members of the staff left. Well, of course they left. She brought them in. They were tied to her. And so they left. What I've seen with staff, however, those not involved with planning, um, who are just overwhelmed, but with the rest of the staff is once Reva left, suddenly it was a lot more relaxed. And because she was trying to micromanage everything. There was a lot of problems with Reva that you guys failed to recognize, but I'm sorry, you made a bad, bad decision. Bruce deserves it. He's shown his character. You might not like what he did, 
and getting rid of Riva, but half of that was on her because she attacked him as well. But since then, you have gotten along. Oh, you forgot that. So you canceled him. Sorry to hear that. But thanks. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is John Mazza, followed by Louis Silverstein and Bert Ross. Are well, you there, John? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, as everybody said, you blew it. Paul came in third, all distant third, because he was the the other candidates were too weak to beat him because he was weak, but they were weaker. And now he's been he's going to be mayor for 18 months out of the two years. It makes no sense at all. None of the public, except for the toadies, agree with this. It was set up at the beginning of the meeting when Lloyd Ahern said, oh, let's nominate Steve, because everybody knew he wasn't going to take it. Everybody knew you weren't going to vote for Bruce. Everybody knew that the candidates, well, they didn't know for sure, but the candidates that are running wouldn't take it. So, hey. Let's pick, it's all arranged. Let's have Paul. The, the citizens want representational democracy. This is not what's going on in Washington, except you've turned it into that. This is exactly what's going on in Washington. And if it follows through, when, when the anti-development pro-general plan people win next election, do you want them to say, okay, Let's have a February 14th, 2022 committee and put them on it. Do they want, do you want them to take everybody off any political assignment or, or committee that's on the wrong side? It makes no sense. You're continuing a problem that's been going on, it will have been going on for two years, and you're going to make it four years because you're going to lose. The city knows that you pulled a sleazy move here. It is high school. And if you think you're going to win by playing high school, let Paul stay as mayor. Let him pay, stay. I would really doubt if Steve uh, accepts mayor pro tem, which is what you'll try to do. Try to do. Then all of a sudden it'll be Mikey or Karen. Okay? Everybody knows what's happening here. And the public knows, and the election, and you're on video. It's going to be all over the election that you denied the voters the ability to have their own mayor. And that's exactly what you're doing tonight. And you've done it twice. And we are citizens. You work for us. And when you put yourself in front of it and your egos get in the way, you deserve to be gone, period, gone. And Paul, if you don't decline this position, you're a fool. Sorry to say that, but you've ruined the city. We don't have that much time to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, John. And Louis Silverstein appears to have left the meeting. So we'll hear from Bert Ross next, followed by Craig Hill. Thank you. Is Mr. Ross available? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Um, in this whole thing, and obviously we're all sad, there's no happiness at all. It seems to me that Bruce needs to take some responsibility for the divisiveness. Um, I can tell you that I have supported every member of the council uh, un until you started to name call your son who loves you dearly said you never call names. Well, the issue wasn't Reva Feldman and whether she should have stayed or not. Uh, what got me involved in this is when she was called a fascist. That to me is name calling, that lowered the level. Today you were gracious in talking about Paul and the job he did the past year. That was a different tone. That was a different tone than telling everybody on the council that they're in it for the power and the benefit and personal aggrandizement. That's a terrible, terrible way. That's name calling. It's a terrible way to start. I think that you regret that. You came close today in saying for the first time that I heard you, Bruce, when you said, I'm not proud of the conduct and some of the things I read in the report. 
that's not what was coming through in your response before and in the letter. It all had to do with, uh, you know, you were vindicated. Uh, this wasn't within the purview of the investigation. I thought you were human today, and I wish I had seen that side of you. I think your behavior has mo modified. And since we're supposed to be speaking about who the next mayor pro tem is, I think you should be. And I think that if it continues and we're done with these reports and you remain humbler, then I would support you. So I hope they do nominate you for mayor pro tem. I hope you don't decline it. Um, and I just want to say one thing to say that people uh, who were not in support of your nomination are pro development, like John keeps saying. Uh, all I can tell you is that if anybody knows anything about my background in New Jersey, I don't think there was anybody hated more by developers. So I think there's guilt by association. I don't know who these people are who are for pro development or not, but what I have been for is civility and uh, has nothing to do with, with development. Um, so I wish that uh, John would stop saying that and, you know, or at least exclude me from that group. Um, so thank you. And I hope we can make peace. Um, I think it's time. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Do we have Our any other speakers? Speaker? Yes, we have Craig Hill. Hi, Craig, are you available? Yes, I am. Good evening, council and staff and everybody. Um, I feel like we've gone through some sort of time warp or something. I, most of the past year, you guys have been working really well together. It seems like you put a lot of this behind you. Bruce has learned some things. You guys have learned a lot about law from him. Um, you're getting things done, and suddenly all this stuff is, has been hashed up again out of the past. Um, and I, I just feel like if, Paul, if you continue and, and, and accept what you've just accepted, um, a couple things. It's one, you're going to have a majority of the city feeling like the government is illegitimate. And I don't know what the consequences of that may be for the next year until the election. Um, a two, you've just altered the potential outcome of the election because you've just stirred up a lot of ire. Uh, among the people that, uh, you know, I think you, that you might prefer to see in those seats. And, you know, I just find this profoundly disappointing because this should be about public service, not per personal ego. So uh, please do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And Mayor, I have checked. I don't see any of the people we missed earlier in the meeting, and I don't see any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. Thank you. Uh, I believe that now it puts us. I had nominated Bruce for Mayor Pro Tem when we changed course. Yes, okay. Mayor, if you're ready, you can open the floor for nominations for Mayor. I'll open the nominations for Mayor Pro Tem. And I hear a nomination from Mikey Pearson. We just got the order a little wrong. Right. I nominate Bruce for Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Do we have any other nominations for Mayor Pro Tem? Kelsey, will you call the roll? I'm sorry, there was a raised hand. Are you ready for me to call the roll, Mayor? Where was the raised hand? I'm sorry. Where? I I saw it flash for a second, but it's no, none of the council members Bruce. need to see. It's Bruce. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I, I semi appreciate the words of Mr. Ross. Um, he's wrong when he says he hadn't heard me say the things that I said tonight because I actually wrote them to him. Um, he probably just doesn't remember. I'm not saying he, he, he's misrepresenting, but um, I've also offered to speak with him multiple times over the past of the course year, class last year, and he just refused to talk to me. So it, it's just another example of what goes on with people once they get it in their mind, what someone is. But um, Mikey, I appreciate the nomination. Um, better, I guess second is better than first, but I mean, that is, second, second is better than nothing, but uh, thank you, appreciate it. Who knows what this will come? Hi, Bruce, thank you. 
Are there any other nominations? Kelsey, will you call the roll? Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Council Member Uring, you're muted. Uh, Bruce Silverstein. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Sure. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. <laughs> yes. Motion carried. Okay. I believe that puts us now at uh... Hey, Paul. Good yes, news sir. is we know how to work together. We've done it for the last nine months. We do know how to work together. And if Steve changes his mind and wants and, and asks me to, I will be glad to resign and move him into the position. So I'm not doing this because it's a great gig. Uh, so. Mayor Grisanti, you are at the administration of the oath of office to the mayor and mayor pro tem. Would you like me to administer your oath of office? That would be lovely. Thank you so much. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your I state your name. I Paul Grisanti. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear. Or affirm. Or affirm. That I will diligently serve. That I will diligently serve. As mayor of the city of Malibu. As mayor of the city of Malibu. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance. And allegiance. To the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservations. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. And Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, would you like me to administer your oath of office as well? Kelsey, I, I don't mean to prolong this meeting unnecessarily, but I just sent my son, Louis, not Louis, by the way, but that, that, that's not a dissonant. You. His name's Louis. And he's going to come. He's, no, 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 no need. That's, you, you didn't know. You never met him before. He's, he's going to come upstairs. I'm, I just sent him a text to ask him if he could do it. So if you could just bear with me of for course. a moment, I'd appreciate it. Hey, Louis. Louis is mini me, as you will see if he comes on camera. Oh, you're not going to be on camera, you're just going to talk? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Ready? I'm ready. I state your name. I, Bruce Silverstein. To solemnly swear or affirm. To solemnly swear or affirm. That I will diligently serve. That I will diligently serve. As mayor pro tem of the city of Malibu. As mayor pro tem of the city of Malibu. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the state of California. And the Constitution of the state of California. Against all enemies foreign and domestic. Against all enemies foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will and faithfully discharge the duties on which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter again. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, Bruce. Uh, it's uh, supposed to be remarks by the newly elected mayor, and I'm going to make a very short remark that I'm sure all of the council people and other people will appreciate. It is currently 9:10, and I think it's appropriate for us to take a 10 minute recess at this time and freshen up for the balance of the agenda. Or would you 
prefer to press on. I think we just need to take a break. Take a break. I need a shower. Yeah, I agree too. All right. Uh, we will come back at 920.
So. Okay, sorry, I've been trying to get in the meeting for several minutes. Thank you. Well, you're in, and it's just now turned 920, according to Apple. So you. you're right on time. Okay, that brings us to item 2A, which is communication for the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda for for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. City council may not act on these matters except to refer the matters to staff or schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have any people who signed up for 2A? Yes, you have 16 speakers signed up. The first few are Bill Sampson, Ryan, Mark Bowdy, and Brian Wellington. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. I think I should like to notice people that if they are actually talking about something that's not on the agenda, they will get their time. If they want to talk about something else, I'm going to ask the mic to be turned off and go on to the next one. So I think that that's what 2A is for. We've already had a bunch of comments on what has gone before. So who do we have to begin? We have Bill Sampson. Mr. Sampson. Bill, are you available? Because, yeah, I, I am here. Uh, Bruce, you started giggling. I hope your son told you something funny. Anyway, um, Nauvoo Municipal Code Section 17.02.030B provides, in part, Malibu will plan to preserve its natural and cultural resources, which include the ocean, marine life, tide pools, beaches, creeks, canyons, hills, mountains, bridges, views, wildlife, and plant life, open spaces, archeological, paleontological, and historic sites. I was struck in the last meeting, listening to Mr. Fernandez speak to you folks. He's an employee of the planning department. Were I cynical, I would have said, oh, he's auditioning for a job with one of the fixers or expediters around here, Schlitz, or there, there's somebody that sounds like a beer company. Then I decided maybe the problem is education. I think that perhaps Mr. Fernandez and other people in staff, and I don't know, particularly in uh, the planning department, think that the vision statement and mission statement are kind of like those cool posters that corporate America puts in the lunchrooms to try to fire their people up rather than paying them. It says, oh, goody, doesn't that feel good? Isn't that nice? It's a picture of a nice place and that and they don't understand that the vision statement and mission statement are our law. We need to pay real attention to those things. If there is some problem, some developer, some concrete coddler can't, can't get around, the idea isn't help him find a loophole, it's how can we get him to comply with the vision and mission statement? And I'm gonna give Mr. Fernandez and the rest of those people the benefit of the doubt. I think they just don't know this. I think you guys, the five of you, and two of you I can count on, I know, says should take it upon yourselves to educate or ask the uh, city manager, I guess, to educate people about this. Tell them, hey, we mean it. This is for real. This is what you're supposed to do. I have another matter. I spoke to uh, uh, Walt and Lucille Keller, I don't know, maybe a week or 10 days ago. Uh, neither of them is in great health. Uh, they did not ask me to do this. Without them, King Dana would probably st still be building stuff here. I think that's a bad thing. Without them, there's no city. If nothing else, 
They worked their butts off. They gave of themselves. They poured their time and life in it. We should honor them before it is too late. Might I suggest renaming Legacy Park, and I don't know the terms of the deal with Parencio in their honor. Something should be done for these people because it ain't going to last Bill, forever. Bill, that's your time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Mark Bowdy, Brian, Brian Wellington, and Alex Stein. Mr. So Embry, you. are you available? I'm trying to uh, bring up the same topic that I've talked to you about twice before over the last two years, and that is that the city um, clerk's office gets a, re a letter from L.A. County saying they would like you to get into bed with them again and collect money uh, or impose the tax on the fire i'm sorry it's called the fire developer fee where it's something just over a dollar a square foot that's an added tax put on to malibu properties that are being built and not necessarily fire rebuilds but that money is never spent in malibu and paul actually you got it wrong last year when you said oh well we'll use that money to rebuild our fire station well it doesn't work that way this is for new fire stations you need to do your homework this time and i'm telling you two months before this is come and do again because you know the first year yolanda bundy was like brand new the second year was like oh yeah we still forgot to look it up and figure it out this money and these programs uh do not benefit malibu and as we found out in Woolsey Fire, the resources don't come. And if they do come, they don't even use them. And they commandeer the resources that we have for helping ourselves, like the, uh, the fire truck that's supposed to be up at Corral Canyon. So, well, the city has learned and proved in the last two and a half years is that the fire hardening program assessment of the city works and it needs to be expanded. And it needs to be uh, probably uh, four times as big as it is. And we need to use the tax money and convert this program and say, thank you, LA County. We are grown up now. We are our own city. We will administer our own program and we will no longer turn our money over to you. Just like the county was got caught siphoning money off of the library district and uh, the city had to put an audit on them and put a stop to it. And same thing happened. They mentioned somebody mentioned Dean Dana, why the city of Malibu's incorporation was put off because the LA County Board of Supervisors refused to certify our election so they could keep one more property tax installment and get a few more properties approved under the county. Um, their shenanigans, their games, and they usually have to do with money, just like. Santa Monica School District wants to suck our money for the next, what is it, 54 years or something crazy. It's always about the money and they will just continue to keep taking it. So please, this year, say no. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Mark Bowdy, followed by Brian Wellington, Alex Stein, and Craig Hill. Mr. Bowdy, are you available? Are you available, Mr. Bowdy? We are asking him to unmute, but I'm not getting a response. We can move on and try to circle back. Thank I'm you so much. I'm not seeing Brian Wellington in the meter meeting either, so we'll move on to Alex Stein. Alex, are you available? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> okay, so guys, I'm here. So a little bit about myself. My name is Alexander Stein. They call me Primetime 99 Alex Stein. And I'm somewhat of a comedic lobbyist. I, you know, I go triple viral. I follow all these videos. And what I do normally is I call into these meetings and I troll stuff. And I say outlandish stuff like I'm HIV positive or like that I've had, you know, gay sex with like politicians or stuff. I say crazy stuff. Normally, No, listen, listen. I'm not going to say that. Listen, normally I say this wild stuff. And I try to troll these elected officials. But what I saw tonight was such a public embarrassment. Nothing that I could say or do, no words that I could even correspond with my mouth would be more of a representation 
of an embarrassment. And let me tell you something. This is true. I lost my mother this year to COVID-19. That is 100% true. I watched her. She died in my arms. She was given room desivere. We told the doctors not to give her room desivere at Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas. She died six days later. Let me tell you something. Watching her die was the hardest thing I ever experienced in my whole entire life. It's actually toughened me up. And I, I, even though I can't really feel joy, it, it was just an experience that has toughened me up. I know that I'll never face anything harder that, than that in my entire life. But the second, and other than watching my mom turn gray in my arms, the second worst humiliation I've ever seen in my life was tonight. And I am not saying that. I'm not mincing my words. And I'm not saying that as some sort of metaphor. The, just the way that the representation of these politicians, you guys call yourselves elected politicians, and for you to come here and act the age of children shows that this is why the world is so messed up because the people that we put in charge still cannot even check their ego at the door for, for five minutes when they know that this is a ceremonial position at the end of the day, that this is a cohesive team would work better. And the problem is even the double speak that people say, oh, I would want you to be mayor. Oh, I know you're voted more, but I'm still not going to vote for you. And the fact is, dude, the biggest coward of them all, I have to say, is Bruce for even accepting the mayor pro champ position, sadly. And this is me as a troll, because a real man would even step down. Everybody should step down. And I listen, guys, I'm Alexander Stein. I go to meetings all day long. I talk to the House legislature. I go to all, all different states. And, and just the fact that you guys would participate in this, the only person that was uh, honorable tonight was Steve by turning down a position, which that's what Bruce should have done is turn down the position. But of course, he's, he's not going to do that because he knows it would just be another game and then it would just be Mickey or it would just be Karen. It would just be another um, uh, uh, red tape politician getting it by default. But remember, guys, when you take a position by default, that is a participation trophy. That is not earned. That is what a coward accepts. A real human being has to, we live in what is called the meritocracy. You earn stuff on merit. You're not given to it and voted in a three to two vote by people that are elected to represent people that they don't represent whatsoever. And you spend hours and hours and hours. And I have hours of time. Thank you for your time, time, Alex. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Lance Simmons, Norman Haney, and Lonnie Gordon. Hey, Craig, are you available? Yeah, hi, uh, Steve, I've had that shower go. Uh, I, I wanted to welcome our new Lost Hills liaison, Chad Waters, but I haven't seen him in the meeting tonight. Um, Jim, Jim Braden, I hope you're feeling better. PCH has gotten less safe, especially over the past months. I know that the council staff and public safety commission have been thinking about this a lot. I'd like to add a few thoughts. There are technical fixes planned that will help, but the main problem requires more than new traffic lights, paddles or whatever. We need better enforcement of existing speed limits and noise ordinances. Some things should be enforced by the sheriff, while others are more strictly in the jurisdiction of the CHP. The insane late night car rallies are increasing in number and intensity. At least once the intersection at Topanga has been taken over by hoodlums doing donuts. With the parking lot car meets, it's like Malibu has become the new Van Nuys Boulevard. Some nights it's like Mad Max out there. Apparently these knuckleheads have gotten the message, maybe on social media, I guess, that they can get away with it. All that kind of stuff is mainly a problem for the sheriff. Meanwhile, the Malibu Times reports nine PCH fatalities in 2021 versus three in each of the two previous years, a tripling. Already this year, we've had at least three deaths. If we were to keep on this pace, that would be 24 deaths for the year. For perspective, that's double the 13 COVID deaths we've had in two years. Speed has likely been a factor in many of those deaths, along with inattention, drivers texting, and those are matters more strictly for the CHP. I don't recall why the CHP was dropped in the first place, but it seems increasingly ineffective to have the state highway's basic traffic enforcement loaded onto the sheriff with everything else they have to deal with, especially now. Also, in a recent discussion with staff, I mentioned that the average speed near moon shadows tends to be over 50, with some going 60, and staff replied, well, locals go 45, it's only visitors who speed. That's not my experience. And it made me wonder the extent to which people who don't live in town, such as staff and sheriffs, fully appreciate how much speeds on PCH have been creeping upwards. If we're seeing that tends to confirm that drivers are going faster given the physics of reaction time versus stopping distance. So we've got to make some adjustments. For example, 
Might there be more state funding available for enforcement in hazardous areas? Might we have edged into some higher bracket of eligibility in some category like that? Or could we take funds allocated to beach patrol and apply them to CHP and tell the county to patrol its own beaches? If it came down to some zero-sum trade-off, I think we'd rather be saving lives on PCH over moving drunken bullies off the beach. But it shouldn't be zero-sum. There must be state and county resources available somewhere when lives are on the line. So if we had CHP focused on speed, then the sheriff could focus on the delinquents. Let's please figure this out. Let's do less raining on each other's parades and more working together to keep people from getting killed. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Lance Simmons, followed by Norman Haney, Lonnie Gordon, and Scott Dietrich. Lance, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Lance. Well, after um, that uh, first, the first act this evening, um, even though I tried to get through, I was unable. So it just goes to show you sometimes you can be lucky instead of good. Um, I just want to uh, bring some positivity to that whole discussion, believe it or not. Bruce has offered um, to get briefed on my proposal uh, for a redesign of Pacific Coast Highway. Mikey had made that offer earlier tonight. We have money available, folks. There's infrastructure money available. We can think big. We can think big. We can think constructive. We can think a game changer for Malibu by changing the way in which we view what now is a highway and turn it into a boulevard. And that I, I have, I have uh, commissioned uh, an internationally known architect to do drawings, to do, um, uh, to do an entire rework of that. Um, I have presented it before the Public Works Commission. I presented it before the Public Safety Commission. I would like to uh, present it uh, before the council, but we have an opportunity here, folks. We have an opportunity to bring the forces that govern our city together around something. I don't know, we can have little fights here and there. I mean, that's politics. We can do that, but we have the ability here to make something really big happen. And I implore you all to take advantage of what is right in front of your faces. Forget the recriminations, forget all the nonsense, the name calling, um, forget it. Let's do something positive. And I know we can. The great 20th century Supreme Court Justice, William O. Douglas once said, I would rather create a precedent than find one. Well, we have the ability to create a precedent here. So let's not screw it up. So I implore all of you to let's get on board. Let's see what kind of finances are available to do this. And let's move forward and hopefully move in a positive direction where we can all stand together arm in arm saying this is what we did. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lance. Our next speaker is Norman Haney, followed by Lonnie Gordon, Scott Dietrich, and Jefferson Wagner. Mr. Haney, are you available? Norm, you should see a pop up. There you go. Yeah, um, yeah, I see it. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Great, great. First of all, I misunderstood the agenda where it said presentation to outgoing mayor. I didn't realize that that's where you could make uh, comments about um, the um, the outgoing mayor. Um, so I'm going to make a few right now. Uh, I think Paul has made a, a tremendous uh, mayor for the city of Malibu. Um, I think he's uh, handled all the meetings uh, in a very professional manner. He's worked his uh, tail off. 
I don't think it's a privilege to be uh, the mayor of Malibu. It is a tremendous amount of work and a huge sacrifice with regard to time, uh, his personal time with his family. And so I want to make a statement that I think he's been a great mayor, um, one of the best the city's ever had. And um, although I regret the, content the contention that I heard tonight, I think uh, Paul uh, will put all of that aside and continue to do a great job as he has in the past. Um, and I'm sure all the other people who also sacrifice a tremendous amount of time in an effort to make Malibu a better city uh, will continue doing that. I'm going to move on to something else, and that has to do with our uh, planning commissioners and many of the people who work for the city of Malibu. Malibu is not an easy place to work for. Um, many of the people can't live in Malibu, so they come from different locations. They will take uh, Canaan, uh, Malibu Canyon Road, uh, some of the people take Topanga, but or some of them come from Santa Monica. If you do an analysis on how many additional miles they have to travel each year for the privilege of working for the city of Malibu, it comes up to about 7,000 miles a year. For that, we should compensate them. And I think that the people that should compensate them is the developers. Because if we can keep a good planning staff on board, as well as other staff members, it's going to make things much easier to move projects through the pipeline. Good projects. You know, I, I know some people think that developers get by with bad projects, and I'm sure some of them do. But um, if if we can help move the pipeline through faster, everybody's going to benefit. And if paying them more money, and I'm talking about staff members, then I'm sure the developers will raise Norm, their hand that's and your time. In, increase our fees. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lonnie Gordon, followed by Scott Dietrich, Jefferson Wagner, and E. Barry Haldeman. Lonnie, are you available? Now, can you hear me on this headset? We can. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Okay, let me go the okay here. Um, you know, I was going to talk about two things tonight. Um, one was the Southern California Edison and Clean Power Alliance issue that's come up with hundreds of residents in the last few months. Mine started in November. Most people seem to start in December and January. But there is an issue going on that we need to investigate. I don't trust Southern California Edison in the least. I don't know about California uh, Clean Alliance. I know that Mikey said that he was going to speak on that. Um, I did speak with him. I did, I did speak with Steve Uring because I was trying to find out what was going on. I have filed a complaint with the California Public Utilities Commission. I've spent hours and hours on the phone with Southern California Edison and Clean Power Alliance to find out what's going on. The other thing that I want to bring up is we as Malibu are looked at as a model city for our telecom ordinance. People call me from all over the country to find out what we're doing with our ordinance and what's happening with it. And I have to say, in all honesty tonight, I am so embarrassed by what happened with this. It, I don't even need to go into it. Um, I would like us to finish up with this ordinance and the resolution so that we have the best model in this country, the best fire safety in this country, and um, I hope to work with you, all of you. Uh, I hope to. I hope that we all can work together. But we. But there are two issues here. One is the Southern California Edison and the CPA, and the other is the, the telecom ordinances. So um, I'm just so like plunged is the word I want to bring up. 
about what happened tonight, but thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Lonnie. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Jefferson Wagner, E. Barry Haldeman, and John Mappa. Hi, Scott. Thank you again, Paul. Um, first, to address Craig Hill's uh, comment about where's the CHP, our brilliant legislature excluded Malibu and one other city, I don't remember which, um, from patrolling PCH because, you know, those rich people in Malibu shouldn't get any public support, even though we get 15 million visitors a year. Um, that's why we're in that situation, which needs to be changed. And, uh, okay, what I wanted to talk about is goats. We're going to be dealing with uh, a new budget, and we should allocate money for goats to do uh, fuel control. We all know that's a great solution. Um, it's not like everything else in Malibu. It's not easy. We don't have that much in terms of public land that would benefit. But if we engage someone to do the goats and then identify which areas would benefit from fuel reduction, even if the city doesn't own that, we could, I don't know what the right term, lease out the goats for a dollar a day or you know some such thing. That would benefit the entire city. So um, I'm, I'm urging you guys to set up something, whether it's staff uh, or like the homeless task force, get a goat task force um, to try to investigate what's the best way to do that. What have other cities done? Because some cities have been very successful. We dodged a bullet this fall, um, and uh, we were lucky. Uh, but now it seems like we're in another long-term drought, and everything's really dry out in the canyons. You see chaparral that's died as you when you're hiking or when I'm riding my bike out there. Um, we cannot count on luck to protect us, and we can't afford to have another 400 houses or 500 houses burned. So please try to deal with that. I, I, I think um, starting the investigative process, if we don't start now, we'll never get going. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Jefferson Wagner, followed by E. Barry Haldeman, John Mazza, and Joe Drummond. Hi, Jefferson, are you available? Yes, Paul, thank you. Good evening and thank you council for your time and service to the community. I believe it's Santa Clara or Santa Clarita is the other incorporated city that does not get CHP patrol uh, efforts in that community to answer to Craig Hill and Scott Dietrich's query. Uh, my topic uh, for tonight's discussion is the event on Friday evening or late afternoon Friday at the Soho House on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu across from my retail store. Uh, what I witnessed was a, a difficult situation for both fire service to the event, the fire in the roof between the ceiling and the HVAC unit, and the, the management that the sheriff had to do because the parking lot was overburdened by patrons. So the response by 70, 71, 88, 99, 125, and 67 with a BC uh, battalion commander. Uh, uh, so the response was there. It was timely. They had to use the ladder unit from 125 to service the roof on the Soho house for the fire there because the parking lot was too full. The sheriff was out trying to move the cars out to get the fire equipment in. It could have been a real ugly situation. Somebody needs to look into the parking situation at Soho and Nobu. Those are wood buildings and uh, they got lucky. It was an HVAC unit and an electrical. So please have somebody on staff look at it. I, I saw Chris Frost there. We spoke about it briefly, your public safety commissioner. So that's my concern. It was right across the street from me and I have a lot of photos. Thank you, council. 
Have a good evening. Thank you for that report, Jefferson. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman, followed by John Mazza and Joe Drummond. Mr. Haldeman, are you available? Barry, are you available? Barry, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. If Barry's not available, we can try circling back and hear from John Mazza next. John, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank I you, John. You can hear me. We can well, hear you. Jefferson just brought up a serious matter. Um, the, the, the highway was closed. They had to fight the fire from the street. They had to bring a unit in from out of town because we don't have tall buildings, so we don't have hook and ladders. Uh, and this all goes back to the fact that 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, Soho and Nova were busted for violating their CUPs. And we had five hearings on it at the Planning Commission, and the prior city manager pulled the whole thing under her purview a year and a half ago, and nothing was done about it. And that's why we have a parking situation there, because we refuse to enforce CUPs. Refuse. When I asked about the car show last Sunday, not yesterday, the prior before, I was driving through, and 33 cars went in front of me through a red light across Creek because they wanted to stay together. I, try, I finally got through that. I had two Ferraris in front of me that go down to 20 miles an hour and then race and block the highway. I drove past Topanga, donuts everywhere, donuts everywhere. A year and a half ago, they closed the highway at Neptune's Net. And when I asked planning, the planning commissioner, the planning commission about this, I got the answer. Our compliance, uh, our compliance officers can't deal with that. Well, who can? Okay. I asked if we could. Uh, do something about their CUPs? Well, maybe, but that's hard, okay? The city has to direct these uh, these things not to happen. It's not safe to drive on the highway, and that's your first purview. purview. Now, Scott mentioned uh, safety on the highway. We had a big plan to have safety on the highway. What have we spent our money on? Yes, $14 million for the lights. Good idea. What's the rest? Civic Center Way. That doesn't help the highway. Parking on Western Beach for tourists, that doesn't help the highway. What else? We spent $12 million on that. You have to review what we're doing and put some money into fixing Las Flores and other places rather than just blowing it where everybody wants to do it and review these projects that were approved six years ago without even looking at, and we get these things at Planning Commission, the, Medians in the highway, we're fixing them for $6 million. We aren't putting in a bike path as required and as was specified because you guys, the city council, let them do it that way. So you have to look at the highway and public safety, and you have to take a million dollars off the beach and put it on the highway. They, picking up cigarette butts and driving around in a little ATV is not helping the highway at all. And it's our money. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Ivan Sonai. And then we'll try to circle back to people we missed. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. This constitutes most of what I wrote as a recently published letter to the editor to the Malibu Times. At last city council meeting, there was finally a successful outcome after a year of turmoil and some pretty bad decisions. Another one unfortunately happened tonight, despite much public demand, which finally caused the release of the Silverstein harassment investigation, exonerating him, as well as the denial of the after the fact build with multiple variances for Malibu Country Inn, which the majority planning commission originally approved. As you know, they did not complete proper geotechnical studies for building on a hazardous slope, plus being adjacent to Zuma Lagoon wetlands, to name a few things not to code. Three weeks ago, the Malibu Times front page reported last January 6th, there was a landslide in the Malibu Road Landslide Assessment District. It caused damage to the water main and a gas line was and closed the road. We don't know if it caused any damage to any homes. 
Only a few months ago, you and the city approved a project just west of that slide area based on city planning and planning commission's recommendation with a variance for the factor of safety for a new after the fact build with zero geological study. Planning based their decision on another property's geo report, which is obviously not to the codes. Staff also minimized the fact that there was ever a slide there, which is just irresponsible. I am quite sure the city is now forced to pay to repair all the damage. The lack of geotechnical, et cetera, studies on builds in the area with their increased mass and water usage negatively affects stability on top of constantly improving variances for the factor of safety, which actually circumvents the codes. The first variance for the factor of safety was also recently approved by planning commission in this council in the landslide area of my neighborhood in Big Rock, putting us all at great risk. This is not the first time this has happened in Malibu. There was just a slide at Cliffside Drive on Point Doom on November 1st, where several homes are threatened and there's YouTube footage of a slide nearby only four years prior. There are many more. I hope with this denial of the Malibu Country Inn and the recent slide at Malibu Road that the city will start due diligence when it comes to these regular disasters, especially in the planning department approving new development in these areas. Variances for factor of safety in Malibu must be limited. Commissioner Dennis Smith rightly stated after this same public comment at the planning commission hearing that most of these slides are man-made. Let me reiterate, all development is man-made and negatively affects landslides. The planning department must stop making it so difficult for fire rebuilds and small projects and easy for large scale projects. It needs an overhaul to say the least. To start, there should be regular training of the staff, council and commission of all the codes and how they should be properly applied. And concessions need to be made when it comes to fire turnarounds, et cetera, for in-kind rebuilds and small projects. Like I've been trying to build a small deck and can't permit it for over a year now. And it really needs to be fast tracked through administrative plan review if exempt from building permits. The vision and mission statement should be at the forefront of all planning decisions. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And Mayor, that final speaker was actually Jaden Sonji. I don't see them in the meeting and I still don't see Brian Wellington. So we can try circling back to Mark Bowdy once more. Okay, Mark, are you available? Mr. Bowdy, are you available? We are asking him to unmute, but if he is unavailable, that concludes public comment for this item. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to commission, committee, city manager updates. Do we have any commission or committee reports? No, you don't have any commissioners signed up tonight. Okay. Interim City Manager Steve McClary, can you uh, give us a report? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. Um, I have a number of things to cover here tonight, so uh, bear with me. Um, one, I did want to report uh, regarding uh, the fire that occurred uh, at Soho's, uh, the Little Beach House on Friday night. It was a little bit after five o'clock. Um, was here, and I I saw the extreme number of uh, emergency vehicles that responded to that. Um, and yes, it was uh, quite a large fire. Um, I know that there uh, were 50 occupants that were evacuated. Uh, fortunately, there were no injuries. Um, we did have building staff out uh, to take a look at the property today. Um, and there was damage obviously that was done to the bu building, uh, pretty significant. I uh, want to thank uh, the fire department for uh, their all out and tremendous response to get that under control. Uh, I also want to speak, uh, thank the speakers uh, who uh, raised some concerns uh, tonight and uh, we will be looking into that. Uh, moving on, um, just wanted to report that um, as it was a couple of weeks ago, I did have the pleasure of attending uh, the city managers conference for the League of California Cities. Uh, it was actually a, a really good conference. They covered a lot of very interesting topics, uh, including, um, you know, how we, you know, move forward in the workplace past COVID and uh, uh, and a lot of interesting trends, including, you know, what's happening uh, economically throughout the state. Uh, very interesting to see how things are shifting there. Uh, COVID has accelerated a lot of changes that uh, uh, were, were forecast and, and now they are upon us uh, and we'll, Will probably be upon us for a while. Also, talked uh, heard some very good uh, speakers that talked about uh, kind of the uh, the the new workplace um, and uh, how you can 
really try to attract and uh, keep employees in this uh, in this day and age. And uh, I think a lot of that's going to come down to what we can do to uh, enhance their their working experience uh, and also uh, looking at particular positions where we, uh, you know, maybe we don't need to have them put all those miles back and forth going to City Hall. Uh, of course, we always we also need to have that personal touch here in City Hall. So again, and that's many things that we're looking at. And again, there were some really good things that came out of the conference. Um, regarding COVID, uh, I'm sure people are hearing that uh, the numbers are starting to uh, drop down. I'm not gonna go through all those details right now, um, but the numbers are starting to drop. Uh, the county, it appears to be on track to uh, lift their outdoor masking requirement. They are not there yet, uh, but they are getting closer to that threshold. Uh, it appears that we are going to remain with the indoor masking requirements for some time um, until the county feels that we're down to a certain level of transmission. Um, they, they will not be lifting that. So, but definitely some, some progress being made in terms of the numbers and the numbers of new cases and the numbers of persons in the hospital. Um, right now, uh, City Hall is, uh, is, as we know, is, is closed uh, in response to the Omicron surge. Uh, and as announced, we are, are closed through uh, 22nd of this month, and we are evaluating this week if we can reopen after that date. I want to thank the public uh, for their patience uh, during this recent surge and the closure, uh, and also thank the staff, uh, uh, particularly you know, everybody who's you know, continued to come in uh, and work uh, throughout this event. Uh, but again, we thank everybody for their patience, and we hope to get back open soon. Um, also want to uh, maybe shift here to uh, to the positive. Um, I just want to, you know, I've been here a little over nine months, and um, it's a fantastic community. Um, and uh, you know, I, I watch a little bit about what's happening here tonight, and uh, I mean, I'm I, I'm a, about a, a bit of a loss for words um, because I, I think if we all work together, I think we would find that we have a lot of commonality and we share a lot of the same goals. Um, but I, I just want to take a comment, uh, take a moment to comment um, about the, the staff here. Uh, as, as you know, I came in as a, as a virtual outsider uh, over nine months ago. Um, and I have to tell you from, from day one, I have really been impressed um, with this staff. Uh, They're really some of the most um, dedicated and, and talented individuals that I've ever had the, the, prep, the privilege of working with. Um, we're not perfect. Um, we certainly make mistakes. Uh, there are certainly areas that we need to work on and get better. Um, but I would ask uh, for your patience uh, as we try to work through those uh, and your support as well. Um, I'm actually really excited. Um, I think the city has uh, a number of very positive things going for it. Um, if you look at the structure of the city, um, if you were looking at the structure of a house or an automobile, you would say that it has, that the bones are, are there, that there's good structure uh, and that there's a lot to build on here. Um, and uh, we can be successful uh, if we work together. Uh, so I please ask that you, that you support us and support the staff. Uh, there are a number of, like I said, very dedicated individuals here. Um, and I think you would be surprised um, if you knew what was going on in their hearts uh, and in their minds. Uh, if you look right now uh, and you scroll through the screen, um, you will see a lot of the names of those staff persons here. Uh, they're here throughout these meetings, uh, whether they have um, an item or not. Uh, and it gives me a, a great level of confidence to know that they are here, uh, supporting the community, supporting the council and, and supporting me. Uh, should a question or a concern come up. Um, so I just ask again for your patience and your support uh, as we move forward. Malibu is a great community and we have uh, many uh, wonderful days to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I believe that brings us to city council subcommittee reports and then mayor and council member meeting attendance. Would anyone like to start? Mikey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
just to comment, thank you for all the speakers, but just to comment on a couple. Um, Ryan, on a fire development fee, I remember that coming through whenever it came through last. It was a little while ago for sure. And I was trying to get a grasp on it too. I My understanding of it wasn't quite what you said, but if it's coming up again, we'll take a close look at that. I don't know that it worked the way that you understood, but if it, it may have so, um, if there's a better way to use that or work with that or not use that and use it somewhere else, we'll take a look at that for sure. Um, there was talk about the danger in PCH that's been a subject tonight already. Um, certainly one on all our minds always. And uh, we're talking about the amount of deaths. I think the thing that was overlooked in that count is how the amount of those deaths that was related to homelessness and uh, critical concern there. Um, far too many people run over, but accidents as well. Um, Lonnie talked about CPA. I'm gonna give a report on that in a second. Um, Scott mentioned goats again. I had a talk with someone who said that there may be grants coming up potentially available for goats. So, and that the MRCA would approve the use of goats on some of their land if it would help the city of Malibu. Very interested in goats. It's been kind of a mystery to figure out, uh, but apparently there are people out there with goats and it's possible to bring them in, but it's it's a it's not a small deal. It's a big deal. Um, and as far as the CHP in Malibu, it's something I've been talking with Senator Stern about for a while. It's not easy to change but it's still on the agenda very much. And I completely agree with that. I thought it was fantastic when we had the CHP in Malibu full-time back in the 80s, 90s, whenever it was, quite a while ago. And um, thank you, uh, Mr. McClary, for your report. I, I agree, you have a very hardworking staff. Um, I really, really, as I get to know them more and more, appreciate the incredible work they do. And it's been difficult. It's been really, really difficult under Woolsey, COVID, historic amount of building permits, applications coming through. It's, it's overwhelming. So lots to do there. And everyone takes it very seriously. Um, I'm going to go over my report on the CPA first. I have a whole briefing that was sent to me by the CPA. I'm not sure of the order it's in. I've only had time to go through it briefly. So SCE increased the delivery rates in October of 21 and January of 22. And this is increased from SCE was to deal with the past and future wildfire liability. Go figure. So one thing I want to make sure everyone understands, there's two fees on your CPA bill. One's for the delivery by SCE and the other one's for generation by the CPA, the Clean Power Alliance, Clean Renewable Energy. Um, added to the mix here on those SCE delivery rates increases, December was an especially cold and rainy month leading to increased energy use everywhere, which did not help with SCE's higher rates. Um, CPA has actually not changed their rates since last July. STE mistakenly, here's the part that's really gotten everyone, mistakenly omitted the CPA charges, the generation charges from CPA on about 30% of the bills in Malibu. So higher than the initial uh, number I heard. Um, so that's, that's a big number of people. So that means, and supposedly it was about 30% of everybody, and that's that's the 300,000 accounts at least, if I have that right across their area. So bills that some residents got in late January and early February included the missed charges from the previous month, as well as the current charges. Next is SE charges are typically about two thirds of a customer's bill. That's SCE's charges. CPA charges are about one third. So customers who got these catch-up bills saw bills that were maybe 30% higher than normal to make up for the facts that their bills were probably 30% lower than they should have been the previous month. Some people are talking that there's exceptions to this. 
And I just want to say one woman got a hold of me earlier and I looked at her numbers and I didn't quite follow what was going on there. So I'm glad to forward problem bills straight to the CPA. So feel free to send them to me or I can connect you directly with who you need to send them to. Um, as Lonnie said, it's, it sounded like, and we've tried talking a couple of times, but it sounds like she might have a different issue than just that issue. Uh, she has a different kind of meter. So I'm not sure. Um, whatever it is, let's try and take care of it. So SCE was aware of the error on the billing. Ready for this one? In early January, but did not notify CPA until nearly one month later when CPA and his customers started to see some abnormally high bills and CPA staff started an inquiry. Isn't that charming? Okay, but there is good news. Out of all this, some good news. CPA customers, if you stay with this, if you're with the Clean Power Alliance, you will see an overall drop in your bill starting a, sort of around March 1st by about 6%. This 6% drop only applies to CPA customers, not SCE customers. Um, Malibu residents who opted out of the CPA, which is your right, um, and get their generation as well as their delivery from SCE, will see about a 15 to 20% increase in their generation rates. Being on the board of the CPA, I can tell you it's very complicated energy, how it works. And it involves a lot of futures and, and dis purchases and giant agreements and new solar farms and it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. So there have been times when CPA has been a little higher. We are now going to go into an era where CPA is lower, but for clean energy, that's pretty amazing, which shows just what a great job the CPA is doing to me. Um, the CPA will next adjust its rates in July of 22 in line with market, condition, market conditions and with an eye to enhancing the fiscal strength of, uh, of the CPA, which leads to lower costs over the medium and long term. Um, CPA should be very competitive this year, delivering 100% renewable energy to most Malibu residents at a cost that's similar to SCE, uh, which is just SCE is only 36% renewables. Um, and CPA is going to continue to roll out innovative programs and incentives for its customers and the city itself that we can all take care of. Um, So just checking my notes. That's basically what I have right now. I will also add there is a rumor on social media put out that I was a paid director of the CPA. I can tell you there's nobody, none of the directors are paid, nobody's paid. All I'm all I'm giving up is my time and glad to do it. Um, every city that's part of the CPA gets a seat on the board. And um Malibu is credited with helping a lot of other cities join on board because we are very early in it with, uh, I think, with Skyler and that city council bringing it forward. So when we started, we were one of two cities that were 100% renewable energy, and now there's over 20. So it, the program's going well, and um, that's my report on that. Next is... I met with Senator Stern last week at the Point Doom Headlands, and mainly we met with Jerry West from Beaches and Harbors, and that was to find out what's going on with that project. It's sitting there and nothing's happening. And the reason is fairly COVID predictable. Supply chain issues, and they can't get some of the final parts to finish the stairway. It's close to being done. They also had some fairly significant um, water damage from those torrential rains. So they're having to take a close look at that. There's an old swale we looked at that looks in terrible shape and they're trying to figure out who owns that swale. <laughs> Could be the city of Malibu even, not exactly sure um, yet. So that, that was in that meeting. We, we had a hit list of, of things to work on uh, as far as that. It also gave me a chance to continue talks with Senator Stern on the bill he's working on for additional funds to stop car racing and car shows. There's another word they use, a buzzword I can't remember. Um, and 
Senator Stearns agreed to come out to Malibu and give a press release and talk to all of us when the language on that bill is finished. So hopefully there's good news there and more money. And I don't know if it involves the CHP or just money. So I don't think that's yet to be worked out, but we would appreciate that help. The other thing working on, and I've talked with uh, with Steve, with Steve McClary, is we still desperately need to come up with a temporary tow yard for this summer. And a bunch of people are working on that. It's uh, it's pretty critical and um, and needed. Um, as you know, I think last year, what did we write? A million dollars in tickets? It's just unbelievable. And uh, so that's that's pretty important right there. Um, other than that, I attended a CPA meeting right, right when the whole billing error, billing issues started. Um, I attended a LACO meeting, um, with Karen, where we continue to advocate for, uh, school separation and it's actually going quite well. Maybe I'll let Karen elaborate on that. Um, and I think that's my report today. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to thank the public speakers, and I would like to thank uh, Kay Gabbard and Oscar Mondragon for uh, their report on the Malibu Community Labor Exchange and for all the work they've done there for such a long time. Um, Caltrans, I'm excited about this uh, mural, and I'm pretty sure that the Cultural Arts Commission will be very excited to uh, put the word out to our local artists and um, and get some uh, submissions for that. Uh, I also been out to the Point Doom stairs. I didn't know Mikey had been out there. Uh, I got a call from someone who lives right near there. Not only that the project looks like excuse me, that it's been abandoned, but the erosion there is really serious. Uh, and I, I too want to know what's going on there. It's, it's concerning, both the fact that the project is, looks dead in the water and that uh, the erosion is really, really frightening. Um, I too got a lot of emails, I'm sure everybody did, about their SoCal Edison bill. Um, I have forwarded those to Edison. I got another one this afternoon. Uh, and it looks like we have a partial explanation there. Um, regarding school district separation, first of all, I want to thank everybody who called in uh, to the February 2nd Laco County Committee meeting. Um, this is just a long haul project. Uh, there's no getting around that, but there is some progress. Um, uh, the city and the school district have agreed on a mediator and a date has been set uh, for the first mediation um, that will be virtual. And uh, both sides agreed to ask the county committee to postpone uh, our item to the April, well, actually to the month of April. I, don't, I think it'll be a special meeting. I'm still not sure. As soon as we know the date in April, of course, we'll be putting that out to the community. Um, and since we last met, uh, yeah, we did have another pedestrian fatality near moon shadows. And um, from my understanding, it was someone uh, running across the highway to meet friends at the restaurant. So that continues to be a very dangerous stretch of the highway. Um, Yeah, Friday, I must have driven by the Soho house minutes before the call went out. Uh, I drove by right around five, maybe a few minutes before. I saw that giant ladder uh, when I got down near sunset heading up toward the highway. So I knew something was going on here. Uh, I drove back by it at 10 p.m. I had gotten a bunch of texts while I was uh, out of Malibu. I drove back by it at 10 p.m. to see that there was still equipment there. There were still firemen there in full gear. Uh, I do wanna thank uh, the um, chair of the Public Safety Commission, Chris Frost, for being in a good mood when I called him at 10 p.m. 
to tell me what he knew about that fire, um, that it was uh, something in the kitchen vent. He sent me video of it. He said he was nearby when it broke out. I think uh, Keegan Gibbs was also nearby. They were both over there. Um, that's very concerning. And yes, the parking, not being able to get in there is a concern. Uh, and on a Friday night, yeah, what else would we expect? So I'm not sure how we're going to deal with that, but it's a dangerous situation. Um, let me see here, what else? Steve McClary, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your work. I appreciate that. And I, um, I agree with you in acknowledging the staff. It pains me when I hear people criticize the staff. Uh, to my knowledge and in my experience, they're hardworking. They're, they, so many of them go so far above and beyond. Um, and, and I too would like to see uh, what you mentioned, how to enhance the workplace experience and just uh, hopefully we can begin to raise morale and anybody from the staff who's in this meeting or is watching right now, I wanna say to you what I've said to you before, I consider all of you my coworkers. I appreciate what you do and I just wanna help you, uh, help us. Um, so yeah, Steve, I agree with you. There's a lot to build on. So I look forward to our progress there. Uh, I think that's it for my comments, so thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, or Steve, Bruce, or Steve? I'll go, hang on a second. Thank you, Steve. Just close that down. Okay, uh, let me start with Mr. McClary. Steve, I do appreciate your comments and I agree with the stuff you came up with. Uh, I also would like to hear about whatever plans you think we can come up with to make the work environment a little more effective uh, and accessible to everybody. I attended a Malibu School Leadership Council meeting, and it's an organization I didn't even know was out there. Uh, and it's basically a group of the, all the members, senior members from all the schools in Malibu get together and they sort of share ideas. So it was an interesting meeting. I learned a little bit of what was going on. I thought it was very effective. I had a dealing with the traffic that we had that last week, but the week before last uh, with the uh, event at the shopping center and the speeding up and down the PCH. I had a meeting with the sheriff, with two of the public safety commissioners, and with Susan Duenas, uh, for purposes of sort of seeing what, we could, what the sheriff could do to try and help us out. Uh, and I know Steve McClary had a meeting after me with that, the sheriff. Uh, and I think what we, we got out of that, if you saw this week, uh, there was a little less speeding going up and down PCH. The sh sheriff had more resources uh, on the streets here in Malibu. And I think that significantly slowed down some of the uh, activity that we've been traditionally getting from these cars pulling out of these car shows and taking off. Uh, this week, Sunday, I guess it was, I walked over Sunday morning I walked over to the um, shopping center, the village shopping center where they typically have the car shows and it was a mess again. Uh, I mean, there were cars backed up and if, if you were trying to get through that shopping center or if an emergency vehicle had to come through that shopping center, all, all the lanes were full. There was no way that they could get through or get out or anything like that. Uh, and when I talked to Chris Frost, I understand that the city has made some overtures to that shopping center to put some signs in there, which would make it more easier for the sheriff to enforce some of the stuff that's going on. So one of the things, and, and I don't know whether this goes to Richard or to John, but I'd like to know what st steps you have to go through to pull a conditional use permit. And I don't need a whole bunch of detail. I mean, I just like to know high level. Do we have to have a, a meeting? Do we have to have a conference? How many votes do we, how, what, just laying it out so we've got some idea, because I'll tell you what, if the shopping center isn't going to work for the citizens of Malibu and help us out, uh, maybe we got to do something to get their attention. 
uh, because continuing these car shows in the, you know, the, the method that you're doing over there is not helping the residents or the city up at all, the city at all. Steve, do you want to say something, McClary? On that topic, or are you? Whenever you're done, Council Member, I, I, I did want to actually address that co that topic, and I meant to bring it up in my report, but whenever cool. you're done. I'll, I'll be done shortly. Okay, so well, I would like if either Richard Malika or John, just give me a quick, you know, bullet points in terms of what you have to do to consider repulling a conditional use permit. I just like to have that in my, my back pocket. Uh, I talked to some of the folks from the homeless task force. And apparently they're preparing a report they're going to send up to the city that's got some interesting stuff in it. They have done some work and identified an option for potentially putting in some beds outside of Malibu. Uh, and they need some help from the city council to see if they can actually accomplish that. So that report will be coming to us in, in the very near future. And I hope the city council will get behind taking a look at that. And the second thing in that report we're going to see is they they say if we can't get beds outside of Malibu, we may have to build, you know, consider building a shelter here in Malibu. But what they said was before we do that, we should take that to a vote of the residents and see what they say. Uh, and I would agree with that 100%. So we'll see where that little train takes us. Uh, Soho parking, uh, I agree with the, I mean, Soho, I mean, I was on the planning commission when we were playing around with Soho, Nobu, uh, still has not been resolved. And, you know, the fire truck, the ladder that went up to put out the fire on top of Soho, that fire truck was parked on PCH because it couldn't get into the parking lot to, to get close enough to the building to deal with it. And that's another very serious issue. So I think this issue of figuring out what we're going to do with that parking at Soho and Nobu, again, is, is in front of us. And hopefully we can get a hold of something and do something with it. Uh, school separation. You know, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, whatever it was, we voted on sending a proposal to the Santa Monica School District dealing with putting money into these top tier one schools. And I've never, I've never heard of what response we got. I spoke to, uh, who's a young lady from BBNK that works with us? Christine, Christine Wood? Christine Wood. Yeah, okay, I spoke to her uh, and she said we, they had not got a, res a formal response back from the school district yet. So I'm just wondering what response, did we ever get a response back? And do we ever talk to the schools that, that, that we're trying to get to be on our side, right? Did anybody go to them and say, hey, if we give you this money, will you help us? I don't know what, so, so if you could sort of maybe in the future, give us a little up, uh, update on where that is and what we did and what we didn't do. I mean, we're into this thing right now from the city for close to seven, close to three quarters of a million bucks. Uh, so I just want to keep the residents aware of what's going on. Uh, so they've got, you know, a good handle on, on the separation process. Uh, Mikey covered the SEC bills. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I just want to acknowledge the comment that Bill Sampson made regarding, I mean, maybe trying to do something for his Walt and, and Lucille Keller. Uh, you know, they are sort of cornerstones for our city. I'm not sure exactly what we should do. I'm not sure renaming Legacy Park is the right thing, but I'd like to bring an item back to the city council and just let's think about what it is we can do because I do think they deserve some recognition. And I think it's, you know, before they go, this is the time to give it to them. So Paul, back to you. I'll just say quickly, Steve, they live right near Charmley. It might be something to think about too, that, over that way. Yeah, I mean, we gotta do something for them. Great. Steve, McClary. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council. Very briefly, I just wanted to note, uh, and thank you for bringing up the car shows, uh, Council Member Ring. Yeah, we did put out some additional resources this weekend, and of course, we have been working with our public safety partners as, as well, and we will continue to work on that. I've also been in direct discussions with the property managers there. I think everybody agrees that this is an intolerable situation and something needs to change. Uh, and if necessary, uh, you know, we will work with the property owners to do what they need to do to make sure that that property is being managed in a way that uh, is functional for everybody because I think the truth of the matter is it's the only people who are benefiting right now are the people who are coming out to see these cars and basically getting a free car show and the folks who are showing up with their cars and taking over the parking lot. So it's not doing any good for anybody. So just wanna let you know that we are working on that. 
Um, but, uh, and, and then in just in terms of the, the street racing and that, uh, we couldn't agree more. Uh, I think for those of us who are on PCH, uh, you know, we already know how dangerous the highway is on any given day. Uh, so it is unfortunate that for some reason they have chosen uh, Malibu as a location for that, but uh, we will continue to uh, make it an unpalatable location for them as much as possible. Thank you. And let me thank just you. one more. Uh, thank you, Steve. I mean, the speeding on PCH was significantly reduced this weekend. All right. I mean, yeah, I live above it, so I see those cars going back and forth. And let me just, you know, I know you guys are working with the property owners, but let me just suggest something. We've been, the, the path we've been going down says if you hold this car show, we're going to consider that uh, a, a temporary use permit event and, and take that, you count that against your future permit. Shopping centers don't care, right? They, they, they keep running us. They don't care what we're doing with temporary use permits. If you're going to get their attention, I think we got to come up with something that gets their attention. Uh, and, you know, pulling their, their uh, use permit, conditional use permit, or at least threatening to do that and showing them that it can be done, may be something that gets their attention and gets them to work with us. So for whatever that's worth, Paul, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Bruce? Sure. Thank you. All right. Lots of covered tonight. Let's see. First of all, Steve McClary, I, I can I echo other people's um, thank you. Thanks for the comments you made about the staff. I, I, I think that's right on target. And I think they, they need to see more appreciation. Um, they're working hard and we need to find ways to um, better motivate them, um, as well as you. I mean, you've been doing a great job, too. And I've been I've told you that multiple times. I'm very pleased. Um, I did have a very good call earlier this week, or I'm sorry, late last late last week with um, Richard Malika and Adrian Fernandez about some ways to um, better um, pre better to better um, present to us um, discretionary matters that um, could go either way and aren't really matters of law on on development. And I, I think we made some progress on understanding where each other are coming from. Um, and we're going to continue those conversations. It's good to hear Jefferson tonight. Always, always appreciate hearing from him. Um, you know, I, I really appreciated Alex Stein. I don't think he's still on the line for, for the comic relief. I mean, he, ma he made some very poignant comments earlier and, and, and even in his comedic comments, they, his, his points were well taken. Um, a lot of times the best political commentary does come in comedic form. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was a guy showed up with, with a sock puppet. He was somebody from Encino. I forget the guy's name. He had me in stitches. But, you know, the, beneath the comedy, he was making important points about dysfunction in government. And those are things that people pay attention to. Um, Lance, I, I, you know, I, I did raise your bringing up your highway um, proposal from during the election last meeting I, I I think that's something we definitely should be looking into so there there's there's just there's billions of dollars available from the federal government and from the state government and um, something that might not have been even dreamable well it was dreamable but not not achievable beyond a dream a year or two ago might actually be possible now um, enforcement I mean I, I it's probably one of the subjects that I hear the most from residents about is their complaints that things are going on that are that they perceive to be unlawful. They may be right, they may be wrong. They're often right, sometimes they're wrong. Um, but that the city's not doing enough to by way of enforcement. This is what Steve was talking about a few minutes ago too. Um the response that often is given, which is which is it's technically true, is our enforcement folks don't just have the power to unilaterally shut something down or, or, or assess major fines or as for an example of the CUP, pull a CUP. But, you know, the city does have the authority, does have the power to go to court. Um, and we also, we as the city council, I would hope could take a look, better look at our code provisions regarding fines, penalties, and enforcement, and maybe, you know, give them some teeth that they don't currently have so that um, in the future, people will take the law seriously. Um, look, I'm, I'm exhausted from earlier, um, as I'm sure you all are. I just wanna say, I, I know that my pursuit of initiatives I committed to pursue during the election have caused controversy, particularly my commitment to seek the removal of the now former city manager. 
those are commitments I made in the election campaign, and I believe in honoring my commitments. As I said earlier, I'm not proud of, my, of the controversies I've caused, but I am proud of the fact that I've remained committed to honoring my commitments, even if doing so causes the torch and pitchfork crowd to repeatedly show up and call for my head. Uh, there's an expression that when you're a hammer, every problem's a nail. You know, because I was a litigator for 30 years before being elected to city council, I did tend to approach political disputes like litigation. I was known as an aggressive and confrontational litigator, and I approached political disputes in a similarly aggressive and confrontational manner. And I've learned a lot over the past year, and I now have a better understanding of how less confrontational ways can be used to achieve moving results moving forward. It's not to say that there isn't still room for confrontation when confrontation is necessary. But in any event, my first and foremost priority has been and is to be responsive and responsible to the residents of this city, however that's best accomplished. Even if my personal preferences diverge from that of the residents, I'm committed to advancing the preferences of the community. That's what I, that was the main state plank that I ran on. And that's my overriding objective as an elected representative. And I hope that that's an objective shared by the entire city council, despite what I believe tonight was a slap in the face to 2,414 residents, most of whom I suspect will remember what happened tonight when they submit their ballots in November 2022 election. Just tonight, Terry Lukoff already went on next door. All he wrote was 2,400 voters told by city of Malibu city council tonight their vote didn't count. Terry, you're absolutely right. It's a shame that that's the way things have devolved. But I will continue to work for the residents. I will continue to do what I believe they want. And again, even if that's contrary to what I want, if it's what the residents want, that's what we're here for. We, we, we answer to the residents. And I think we've made a lot of inroads in the past year of getting things done for the residents that weren't being done before. And I'll continue to fight for that as mayor pro tem and a member of the city council. And to, to go back to Alex Stein, I think, you know, to a great extent, he's right that I was a coward for not rejecting the mayor pro tem position. But you know what? I need to be in some position where I can still fight for what I believe is right and for what I believe the residents want. And better to take the um, slate from the city council and continue to fight than to just back off. As I said in the election, I won't back down and I won't. I'll try to do it less controversially and co aggressively, but I'm not gonna back down. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, like everybody else, I've had a busy couple of weeks and I would, uh, I'm hoping to have a meeting with Steve McClary tomorrow or the next day about an idea I have for the shopping center car show thing that will cause them to opt to not come here. And it would require the cop cooperation and I think we can get it because, but I'd love to talk to you about it. And hopefully you will say, that's a good idea instead of Paul, you should never mention that in public again. So we'll find out. Uh, uh, two Sundays ago, I, uh, Malibu has a very distinguished resident, Dr. Marwa Singh. He is, uh, he was a Fulbright scholar who came to America in 1953 and uh, to, to study dentistry. And uh, over the time, he opened his house to other people. And uh, the, Sikh, the Sikh community has a, a religious tradition of accepting all religions. And uh, they have worship services and then they feed the people. And he's been doing that for years. And in the 60s, he donated the first Sikh uh, temple, not only in Los Angeles, but in the United States of America. There's currently over 300 of them. Uh, they honored him at that temple for his 96th birthday. And I was able to attend and uh, hear some of the things that people said about him and witness the charitable works he's done over the years. And I was, uh, while I was there, Brad Sherman's uh, deputy was kind enough to come and talk to me as he was, they've known each other for years and he came and he's a great citizen of the community. And I think that uh, 
I'd, I'd like to do something for him soon also. Uh, the following Thursday, uh, I was invited to, uh, to the Strauss Institute and uh, that promotes and teaches mediation. Uh, years ago, I took a course at the Strauss Institute, which is a part of the Pepperdine Law School about mediation and why it's better than litigation, quicker at least. And uh, I gave a talk on the difference between mediation between two parties and mediation in the political world and, and the difficulty that happens because in, in my normal business life, I only have to please one family at a time. And in the political uh, domain, there are somewhere near 5,000 families in Malibu and they don't all agree and all the stakeholders don't agree. And that is why politics is a lot tougher than what I do for a living. And so it's, it's, it was interesting. The following day on uh, Thursday, no, on Friday, uh, we had been requested by the Council General of the state of Qatar. They have a, a uh, consulate in Beverly Hills. And there's a new Council General. He's been there for about two months. And he called the city and asked for a courtesy call. And so I went. And uh, they are very much involved in promoting soccer. And in the last year, they built a soccer uh, center in Orange County. They have another one that they're starting for the city of San Diego this coming year. And he talked about things that they might be interested in getting involved in uh, as far as public recreation facilities for Malibu or other opportunities. So we had a nice conversation and I'm hoping that that will lead somewhere for the city of Malibu. Uh, the next day, which was the Saturday before the Super Bowl, I went to a charity flag football game that was being held at Pepperdine. And uh, I was invited there to do the coin toss and I ran into the council general there as well. So they're, they're very active reaching out to see what's going on. Uh, and then that is about it. And like everybody else, I watched a little football on Sunday and it uh, managed to be a nail biter to the end. So that was good. And I think that has nothing else to do. So do we, uh, I now think we go to the consent calendar. So that will be item 3B2 is a warrant register. Mayor Grisanti. Yes. We what have, have I missed? One, we have one member of the public signed up to speak on item 3B4. That's Norm Haney. And then Jaden Sonji signed up for every other item on the consent calendar, but I don't see them in the meeting any longer. So 3B4, we're going to pull that. And does any member of the council want to pull anything that's on the consent calendar? I see no hands. So can we get a motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item 3B4? I so move. Oh. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar with the exception of 3B4. Is there any discussion? I'm going to call a question. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Council Member Uring, you're muted. You're still yes. muted. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 3B4. And you said there was a member of the public that pulled it? 
So yes. I guess they speak first. We have Norm Haney here to speak. Thank you, Norm. Are you available? I certainly am. You know, I've spoken to this uh, this issue before in the past. Um, there is no equal replacement uh, for person to person communication uh, with respect to the city council meetings and with the planning commission meetings. And I, I think I, I think that it is time that we started meeting again in person. I see no reason why we should not. Um, you know, if everybody has to show that they're vaccinated, then we can do it that way. Uh, they can easily sit uh, six feet apart uh, and wear masks. And the city council members and planning commissioners at the dais um, are, they can have uh, dividers, plexiglass dividers, and they're 20 feet away from the person that is speaking. But I think it's important. Um, that we start communicating in person and having meetings. The same thing goes, uh, in my opinion, uh, for opening up the city hall. Um, I, it makes it very difficult for the people that work for the city of Malibu, the staff who works incredibly hard um, to get things done without being able to speak directly to the people that are making the applications and the issues involved. So those are my comments. If you can go to a football game, if you can go to a, a bar, if you can go to a restaurant uh, and, and wear a mask and stay apart or not, it's time for the city council and planning commission to get back to in-person meetings. Um, I think they're, they're uh, much more desirable than uh, Zoom meetings. Thank you very much for your time. Those are my comments. Thank you, Norm. Are there any other comments on item, uh, the item? Jade uh, and Sonji had also signed up to speak, but they're no longer in the meeting. So that concludes public comments. Thank you. We have a motion to approve item 3B4, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Three Three B four. I'd like to make a motion that we approve item three B four. I'll second. Okay, we got a motion and a second to approve item three B four. Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll? Mayor Crisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 4A, which is to adopt an urgency ordinance number 498U, amending ordinance 465U, temporary rest restaurant recovery program. Do we have a report? Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. What you have before you this evening uh, comes from our update to you last month, which was on the status of the two urgency ordinances that were adopted by the council in 20 in, in 2021. Uh, let's get my date straight here. Uh, that to address uh, restaurants, uh, we were having a discussion about the temporary uh, allowance for restaurants to relocate service area outside into common areas or, or parking lot areas. And then also we had provided you an update at that meeting about the ordinance that addressed temporary signage for business uh, in relation to COVID. At that meeting, uh, there was direction provided for the city attorney's office to provide an update to ordinance 456U, which relates to the ability for restaurants to relocate their service area. And the issue that the council was concerned about was the cleanup period. Um, as written currently in that ordinance, once uh, the city uh, lifts the emergency declaration, restaurants have 72 hours to uh, relocate their service area to back indoors and remove any temporary structures or uh, construction that took place during this period. 
the council's direction to the city attorney's office was to uh, modify the ordinance to uh, address section two, subsection D1, which changes 72 hours to instead 30 days. Uh, other than that, the ordinance remains the same. And if the council adopts this this evening, uh, part of the recommended action would be to schedule a second reading for the 28th of this month by the city attorney's office. I'm available for any questions as well as John Cotty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molika. Uh, is there any discussion? Mayor Conti, I just want to note that we had a speaker sign up, Jaden Sonji again, but they are no longer present in the meeting. Thank you, Kelsey. Bruce? Um, maybe my recollection is wrong. I thought we talked last time about finding a way perhaps to allow this um, changed way of doing business for restaurants to continue, period. Uh, not just give them more time to clean it up, but that it seemed like it was a nice, it was, you know, it was by happenstance, it's a, it seems to be one of the few good things that came out of the pandemic and people like eating outdoors. And as long as it didn't create issues that we would need to look at. I thought we were talking about letting it continue indefinitely. Did, am I remembering incorrectly? Mikey has a comment, I think. Uh, close. I think we would we would have to, this is a temporary ordinance. So I think we, we would need to modify it. And there's not, there is some things we would need to figure out because not all situations are created equal. I've been working on that with Trevor for a while, uh, looking at what other cities are doing. So if you like, we can we can look at that to bring something back on that uh, along those lines, because it, it's there are some nuance and details that have to be sorted out. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense, though, to figure that out? In, in the event we're going to go that direction, which we may not, but if we were going to go that direction and, and let restaurants continue to operate that way, it would, it, to me, it would make sense to do that before they had to disassemble their operation and then put it back together again if we agreed to it. So I mean, is 30 days enough? Is, it, you know, is, is, is that a solution to giving us more time to figure it out, I guess is my question. I think it's a good point. I think we need to move on it. But may, maybe give them 60 days or 90 days instead of 30, which gives us some more time to get things into a permanent solution. Once we're not, we're not at the end yet. So, you know, we're at least 30, 60, 90 days away right now, uh, depending on the number we use, we're probably not gonna be at the end for another month or two at least. Just, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't use a higher number. Would that, uh, my question is, would that require uh, a, a change in the number, would that, require that this be brought back with a higher number in it, John? Mayor Grisanti, no, it would not. You can amend by interleviation that number from 30 to 60, provided you can make the urgency findings. And I would also note that this is an ordinance, as, as, an, urgency, as an urgency ordinance, it takes effect immediately. It does not require a second reading and then 30 days. It's effective immediately. So um, as okay. Councilmember Sorshine notes, this will take effect or will be in effect for 30 days as currently drafted for 30 days beyond the termination of the local emergency. So um, you can change that number. You would amend by interlineation and just direct that and we'll correct that as the council deems appropriate. So my, my, my proposal is to um, amend this to be 90 days. That, that ought to give us the time if we, if we work hard at it to get this under control. And it's not like we have to do it within the next 90 days because we still have at least 30, 60, 90 days, whatever, before the emergency is lifted in the first place. Okay. I, I would second I that. that. Okay, that's a motion. It was seconded. Steve has his hand raised. Yeah, just uh, I remember when they, we talked about this last time, Richard Malika mentioned that if we were going to do this on a permanent basis, there were a couple of issues that we had to solve. We got to solve the parking issue, I think. We got to solve if there's a septic issue. Uh, so, you know, maybe before we, and I don't have a problem, maybe you ought to get a list from Richard in terms of the issues we got to go around to make sure we can see if this works before we start heading down a path to make it work without knowing what the impacts are going to be. I'm, you know, uh, so 
I would just suggest keep it where it is today. We can always bring it back. If these are immediate, immediately ordinances that immediately go into impact, if 30, 60, 90 days from today, we want to do it again, we can do it and it, it works immediately, but at least we'll know what the hell we're doing versus uh, sort of wandering in the dark. Okay, Karen? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing that Steve just said. Uh, I'd like to hear from Richard uh, about uh, the parameters of this, the consequences. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot right now, but if we're going to uh, consider something like that, I just wanna make sure we don't have unintended consequences. So we might need to uh, get more information or think that through before we make this decision. What I decide can, as moved. What I can share with the council is that it appears, uh, um, as I mentioned, as I think I brought up at the last meeting, I want to say that we approved um, roughly uh, 17 of these permits. It was going to allow for the loss of a, a little over 100 parking spaces, but in, rea in reality, only 51 parking spaces were lost citywide. Uh, it did not seem to present a problem. Uh, we, but the one could argue it didn't present a problem because we're in the in the middle of kind of odd times and it, and it's not normal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of the one thing that we have to. Uh, somehow tried to account for. Uh, but to me, the, the concerns with moving outside and uh, would be that uh, parking in some of the older buildings that were county approved where they don't meet the city's parking standards, our standards as, as a city, uh, we require more parking than the county did. So a lot of those older county developments uh, by today's standards are underparked. Uh, so my my concern would just be what if all of a sudden we had um, normalcy and all of it, and it became a parking issue. I think that's one thing to look at. And then the other question, because yes, I, I personally, I love the outdoor dining. I like it a lot better than inside. Uh, we, we would just want to make certain that we don't overtax uh, the wastewater system capacity. And perhaps that could be addressed by saying that you can't, um, overall expand your seating you, you have to maintain you may have more service area because more of your indoor space is now uh you're not using it but perhaps maybe more space between tables or something like that uh, you know we might want to consider perhaps looking at our, uh, changing our right now we limit restaurants and parking is related to service area not necessarily chairs uh, perhaps that's something we'd want to consider is looking at chairs so that we would be able to allow these folks to, uh, you know, we'd have a mechanism to keep a, a 50 seat restaurant, 50 seats and not let them double that or something like that. So I do think there are some little details we would need to, to work out. And also the question would be if how to handle the um, conditional use permits. The conditional use permits that we've issued to restaurants within the last 15 years, we've made it a point to uh, usually, uh, I, I want to say 90% of the time, we identify indoor seating areas and outdoor seating areas. So I would think that we would want to somehow reconcile any changes we make. So we'd want to come up with a, a way to do that. So I, I don't mean to, to put roadblocks out there. I just these are some of the issues we deal with and just wanted to share those with you. Thank you, Richard. Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, well, so, you know, I, I don't see that giving folks 90 days as opposed to 30 days when this thing comes to an end is really going to pos can't, can't even possibly be a material hardship on the city because it's already been going on for however long it's been going on. And we're only talking about whether they have to stop it 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days after the emergency has ended. Um, but giving them that extra time might be what we need to work out a permanent solution, which, which might actually get done before the emergency ever gets lifted anyway. But that, that's the only reason I was suggesting that, because it's there's not a material difference to us. We've been going on a year and a half already, whether if the emergency stopped tomorrow, so instead of 30 days later, they'd have to 
close up, clean up 90 days later. The issues that Richard talked about, we, we talked about those things before. Other than losing parking, which there's no way to replace if you've taken it up, the other issues are all workarounds. You can, you, for all the reasons Richard just said, you can always limit, and I, I thought that that would be what we would do. You could, you'd limit them to the same occupancy that they had when they were indoors. They just now have more space spread out, including the outdoors. So that doesn't overtax any facilities. It just, it just means there's some more sidewalk that they're using than they were using when they were permitted. The CUPs, I would think, and this is outside my area of expertise, but I would think the statute itself could actually override the CUPs and, and, and have language in it that would explain that this is now permitted despite the language in the CUP. So you wouldn't need to go back and revisit all their CUPs. And it's not like we're talking about 150 restaurants either. Wait, was it 17, I think you said? So it shouldn't be a lot to have to look at. There may be one or two that aren't gonna be able to take to accommodate the lost parking once people go back to their pre-pandemic um, um, activities, but I would imagine many of them will be. And it's a great it's a great bonus, and our residents like it better. It's better for the businesses. So that's why I'm suggesting 90 days rather than 30 days. Thank you, Bruce. I see Steve's hand. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Uh, so. Kelsey, I believe the motion was to extend it to 90. Is, is that correct? Yes, the motion from Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein is to approve the ordinance as amended, extending the period to 90 days okay. to remove the additions. Is there any more discussion? If there isn't, I'd like to call a question. Okay, can you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Yuring? No. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Item 4B is uh, an appeal that has been, uh, they want to continue it to March the 14th. I don't think there's anything we need to do. It's, do we have to say we continue it or anything like that? If, if I may, Mayor. We have not been able to get the applicant to install the story poles that were requ that are required uh, to make this a bit easier for both you and the public to understand the, the changes they've made and what they're proposing. Since th those poles have not yet been uh, installed and we have continued this a number of times uh, while we wait for them to do that, I'd like to ask if it would be okay with the council to continue this to a date uncertain so that once those polls are installed, we can then re-notice it and make sure to alert any members of the public. Uh, the public notice on this went out last year um, and we seem to be getting further and further from that notice that went out and just want to make sure everybody knows about it. Bruce? Richard, when you say we haven't been able to get them to do it, what does that mean? Certainly, we've requested that they install the additional flagging, as we mentioned in our staff report, and they tell us it'll be done in a week, and it is not. And so we followed up with calls and just haven't been able, you know, the, we get promised the date and it doesn't happen. Okay, they're not refusing to do it, they're just running into trouble. Correct. And, I, and I'm and i not aware of if it's a COVID-related issue or something like that, but it, it has not been done. Okay. So, Richard, can you talk for a moment about the amount of extra time they're going to have if they don't comply and, and uh, we put it off and wait for them to complete it and then begin the whole noticing process over again? If... The notice for this, unless I'm mistaken, it'll be roughly a month. Once the polls are installed, we can reissue, we will update obviously the public hearing notice and get it to the newspaper. Uh, the cost would have to be borne by the, the property, app, the project applicant um, as this, they have been a delay in this, uh, but it would essentially mean that once the polls are up, it would take us one month to get them to a hearing. It's hard to believe that anybody would opt to wait an indetermined time when their requirement is that they 
do an updated story poll plan and put the strings up. But I, I guess stranger things have happened. So your advice is that uh, giving them another month is is likely to prove unsuccessful. They're not they're not responding. It, it's been a matter of not they have not been able to complete the task. And uh, Kelsey can perhaps help me so I'm accurate on my timelines. But part of the issue here is that our report to the city attorney's office, I want to say, is I think due this week. And then within about the next week or Kelsey, is it week and a half? You would need to have the report for the council. So it's on time for the March meeting. Yes, the report's due to me February 23rd. Okay. And rather than put it into the middle of April, we should just go to a time uncertain. You think that's the best advice? My concern is like, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the public notice last being sent out okay. around I think November-ish, so there might be folks who forget or, or uh, just feel yeah. like they were not noticed. So can we uh, get a motion? Can I make a motion that we uh, ex uh, delay this to a time uncertain? and take it off take it off the books for now i'll second that john did that come anywhere close to satisfying the legal responsibilities of the way i'm supposed to make a motion i think staff understands uh, your motion and it's to essentially hold this in advance until flagging is done okay all right any other comments will you take the vote kelsey please mayor grisanti yes Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Motion to adjourn. I hear a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes, and thank you, staff. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Thank you so much. Good night.